Nope, I'm okay. Thank you. <laughs> I got my soda just in case. Just in case, but I don't think I'll need it. Check here. Am I online? Sound is on? Okay, yeah. I hear a little bit myself. Okay, most most people are here, so we can start in time. Good morning, PDF. So hope you had a good night, had a good evening, so and are fresh for the second day of our PDF days. Uh, yeah, thank you also for crossing your fingers yesterday, so for the barbecue, thanks again to Adobe for the sponsoring. This was a nice evening, today it can rain, I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this means you all have to sit in a room and do not go into the sun. Uh, we still do the live thing today, so thank you also for this one. So I saw a lot of tweets and something, so I did not check in detail, but I saw something. So but the live stream is going on, so <coughs> please feel free to move on with that. <laughs> for the day. Um, then again, I want to mention that we have this raffle where you can win this nice body bear. So there in the launch there will be a box. So if you have the answers and please add your name, obviously, then <laughs> drop it in the box. And in the closing session, well, after that, we will do the, the raffle then and you can, you can win this. Okay, then we want to start today in the morning here with a keynote. Leonard will take over in a minute. <laughs> so this is the first thing and then we have the yes, hopefully fun thing with the five minute race So we have multiple of our members who will present their PDF solutions But we would like to start with the keynote of today. We are very happy to have Leonard So in case you missed it yesterday, so there was a thank you for Olaf. Olaf is a professor of PDF <laughs> And he's also the first lifetime member of the PDF Association but when I think of Leonard, so he's the next candidate for maybe the next professor. No. Okay, take over for Leonard. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, and, and I appreciate having Olaf on stage with me. It, it worked very well yesterday, so hopefully it'll uh, pan out today as well. So, I wanted to start, I know that the topic on the uh, agenda says that the, my talk was going to be on uh, PDF and mobile devices or what we lovingly refer to as from watch the wall. Uh, I will get there, but I'm going to take a interesting route, I think, to get there. And I, I chose to go this way based on a number of conversations recently, <clears throat> going all the way back to the technical conference in San Jose. Um, some conversations that took place over a lot of beer during the ISO meetings in Ghent. Um, and so I wanted to sort of take us on a bit of a journey. The other thing, as I'm sure many of you are aware, you might have heard that in the United States we have this election thing going on. Um, doesn't get a lot of news, I know, but you might have heard about it. And so the idea we have in the United States, what's called the State of the Union, uh, once a year where the president gets up and sort of lets everybody know how things are going. Um, so with all of this in mind, this is sort of why I decided to take, uh, on, take us on this journey this morning. So hopefully you'll bear with me and I think you'll actually find it um, very interesting. And as I said, we will get to the original topic as we go. So I wanted to start, take us back in history. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is the the beginnings of PDF came from a paper from Dr. Warnock uh, called the Camelot paper. And this is, a, we, is the key phrase really out of the Camelot paper. And a lot of us at Adobe keep this around on our walls and such, sort of remind us of our goal and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and specifically it's that second sentence. The problem is concerned with our ability to communicate visual material between different computer applications and systems. 
And that was really what John wanted to achieve with Camelot, and I think we can certainly say, and as we go through, we've achieved that in the last 23 years with PDF, and that's in no short part to many of you here in this room uh, as well, because it's not just about what we were able to achieve as Adobe, but what we as a community and an ecosystem um, were able to build. Um, the, you know, the old expression, it, it takes a village. Uh, this is certainly the village that has built PDF, and that's going to become very important uh, as we talk about this and, and continuing into the future. So I think one of the ways we've been very successful as a community is that PDF is everywhere. It is not only in applications as it was in the past, but it's built into every platform, every desktop platform, Mac OS, Windows, even Linux platforms. It's integrated not only for things like viewing, but it's also the native printing model that these platforms use. Uh, cloud printing, which actually isn't even represented up here. If you try to print through the cloud, um, printing with most printers, PDF is the lingua franca. It's the way that we're exchanging that information. Every browser today, Firefox, Chrome, even the new Microsoft Edge has PDF native support built in. They don't need extra components. It's integrated. It's just a given. In fact, if you actually read the HTML5 specification, you'll actually find that PDF is a normative reference. They actually use examples in the HTML5 spec of PDF. It is a native part of the web. It's a native part of the open platform that we exchange content in today. It's on our mobile devices. It's integrated and in really into everything we do everywhere we are. And that's a win. That is what has helped us get to where we are today. And I think will help continue to help us grow. So I wanted to take a look at a lot of people, um, ourselves included, really get, find that if we look at what's going on in and amongst our users and amongst the community, we can learn a lot about um, the reality of today. So I thought I'd show you and take you through some data that we've gathered. So the first thing I start with is the fact that we talked about PDF being everywhere in terms of viewing. I thought I'd start with PDF for creation. So this is a look at the breakdown of creators that we've seen um, recently. This is some fairly recent data um, coming out of, our pro out of our products. And I will point out that all of the data I'm going to show you is coming from our products. And I'll talk a little bit about what that really means in a bit. But while we look at this slide, some of the key things you see here are certainly Adobe's products being a very key producer, but Microsoft is right behind us. Um, and thanks to Bruno, iText variants also have a huge impact. There's lots of PDFs being created by iText and its variants. Mac OS, these are the major ones. Um, the, the one that always, Nitro is up here, so kudos to them. The one surprising one in this particular list to me is Amuni, which is a company that's been around for a long time and you never see them. Um, they don't come to our conferences. Duff, put them on your list of people to join the association for next year. Um, yet, there's still a lot of content out there. Now, here's the interesting thing as I go to the list of, of others. Remember that this is not necessarily PDFs that are created today. These are the creators of PDFs that people are consuming today. And this is an important thing. And you look through this list. I actually, when I was going through it, a lot of these names I'd never heard of. You know, and I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. Uh, there were companies I'd never heard of. So you'll notice that some of them are in purple. Those are actually companies or products that are out of business. Yet, these are documents created by these things that are being read today. And what we're learning, what we can clearly take away from that is that this is the whole point of PDF. We don't know how old these documents are. These documents could have been created 20 years ago. But they're being consumed today in readers today. So this stuff has longevity. And that's part of, and a good thing, that we've been able to achieve as a community. So what do we know? So let's talk about some public information, okay, before I get into some specifics, some more specifics from our products. Um, you can do the standard thing we all like to do. You go to Google, you say, tell me about file type PDF, 
As of the other day, there are 2.2 billion, according to Google. Um, Dropbox has told us publicly that there are about 20 billion PDFs in Dropbox today, um, at least that they're willing to disclose. Uh, we know that companies like Airbus, Boeing, the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, we heard from Scott yesterday um, about customers, each of whom having over a billion PDFs individually, those individual companies. Airbus has a billion, Boeing has a billion, uh, Scott mentioned his. You know, and those are just ones we know about. Certainly, I'm sure each of you know customers, uh, your own customers, who have PDFs in that number. Um, Outlook, Google Drive and May, Google processing a lot of PDFs. 73 million PDFs every day are created through the Google family of products. Okay, it's a lot of documents being created. And you know, we get asked like how many are out there? In fact, this came up during Scott's keynote yesterday. You know, and we throw out this number of three trillion. To be honest, I think that's small. But I think the most important thing is, I don't think it's important. The number of, P the total number of documents out there, the total number of PDFs, I think is irrelevant. I don't think it's about the total number of documents that are out there. I think it's about what those documents are, what they represent, what they're made from, if you will, what is used, what are the parts of PDF that people are actually using, and how can we learn from that to really think about what is, and, and I know um, Matt will talk about this a bit this afternoon, what are the important parts of PDF? What are the things that we've really been successful with, and what are the parts that we haven't been? And also, as I'll get to a little later, what's missing? What are the things that we want to see that aren't being used and, and, and could be there to improve PDF? So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to start showing you some numbers from our product. So let me start out by pointing out that these numbers represent cust the actual information, anonymous data from our customers in the Acrobat and Reader desktop products. So first off, these are people who have actively opted in. So they had to take an action to say, yes, I'm willing to let you know that it's okay to get this information from me. So this is opted in. It is entirely anonymous. So even though we have a billion desktops out there running Acrobat and Reader, you know, we also have millions of mobile clients out there. Not every one of those is reporting this data. So don't take this as like every Acrobat user and every reader user. It's not. It's a limited set. It's also, as we just started, as I started the presentation, you know, Acrobat and Reader are not the only game in town. And in fact, I think it's fairly safe to say, and we're okay with, we're not pro we are probably not the number one place that people consume PDFs anymore. We're certainly a significant place. We believe we're still a significant place. But many of you have products that are used by a large number of users. Not to mention, as we said, the browser vendors. Mac OS Preview gets a lot of usage. You know, it's the default viewer on the Mac. The new built-in one in Windows 10 gets a lot of usage. Because again, it's built in. It's the default. So you should take these numbers as a set of numbers from a set of customers. But, you know, so for us it's important. It tells us what our customers are doing. But I think it really does represent a fairly reasonable microcosm of the community at large. I think there's some exceptions, and I'll point those out um, as we get to them. But I think it's still fairly representative. So we can look at how many documents were... So this data, this particular data on this and the following slides is one month of data. This is... The data collected from April 1st through April 31st. I don't remember how many days were in April. 30 days in April? Okay, through April 30th. See, I'm glad. That's why I have Stefan here to correct me. He's very good at that. Um, so 30 days worth of data collected from our products. This is fresh information. So thought it would be useful. So again, um, you can read some of the numbers, but I want to talk about them, again, in relative terms. If you look at the number of users versus the number of documents they opened in Acrobat, it's av obviously we average it out. It's about three documents per user during the month of April. In Reader, it's about two documents per user. 
okay? Obviously, it doesn't normally work that way. We think that, we don't know for certain, but we're fairly certain that most reader users are probably reading one document. Some of them are reading many. With Acrobat, it's probably fairly similar. You know, it really depends on the use case. Um, but this is, as I said, you know, real world data, it's interesting. But I think more than how many documents are opened, it's what they do with those documents once they open them. So it's interesting to see that about 20 to 25% of the documents that are opened are actually printed today. Still, that is a primary use case. In fact, I would, it is the number one use case. After somebody opens a document, other than reading it, the number one thing they do is they print it today. Still very interesting. The other thing that is extremely high use, and again, shouldn't become as a surprise, is commenting, which is why I put it up here. Somewhere in the 5 to 10% range, people are commenting on documents. And I didn't put it here, but I'll, I'll note, and it, again, I think most of you will probably guess this if I were to, to ask, that number, the two most popular commenting tools, post-it notes and highlighting. And then it goes down, strike through, and things like that. But commenting, still a significant use case amongst our customers, at least. And again, I would speculate most PDF viewers. But the one I find the most interesting, um, and you'll hear a couple of talks about this area today, is in the area of digital signatures. 10 million documents, forget percentages, just in the month of April, 10 million PDFs were signed in our, in our, again, in our clients. That's a lot of documents being digitally signed. Um, and that is a number, and you know, I haven't really talked about you know, historical trends, but that is a number that is constantly on the rise. Um, we go back, it is, you know, it is constantly going up. We haven't seen any significant dips in that. Um, if anything, we've seen a couple of spikes certain times of the year. But I think it's something that is clearly growing. I think, as you'll hear about um, a little later from Berndt, things like the EIDIS regulations here in the EU will probably increase that. Um, so I think it's something to keep in mind. I think it's clearly an area of growth um, for PDF and documents. So let's look at some other statistics, um, some ones that I picked out. We certainly have lots and lots of statistics. I just kind of picked out ones I thought were interesting. The largest document that was opened in April was 67,000 pages in length. Um, you know, some months we have larger documents, some months smaller. This just happened to be this month's largest document. Um, I said this to somebody yesterday, and they wanted to know why they were using such small documents. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's all relative. I will tell you, I don't know what this document was. I have no, you know, it's, it's all anonymous. We don't know. The only thing I can tell you is it was only ever opened once. So whatever the person needed, they got it and never opened it again. So that much I do know. Um, so very interesting. But I think the more important things when we talk about the pages, and, and I do think this is significant as we think about our products, 20% of all files opened out of all of the, you know, almost 2 million files, I think it was, single pages. 70%, 10 pages or less. You know, so that's a significant number of documents are what we would consider relatively small, okay? And obviously it goes up as we saw, you know, all the way up to 67,000. But the vast majority of documents opened, at least by our customers. And again, I suspect if we go to look at this across all PDFs, we would probably find that same thing. The vast majority, 10 pages or less. The next piece of information I continue to find shocking is that one quarter of all documents that were opened are image only, okay? So uh, now, I don't know if that's a scan, and this is one of the things we don't know. We don't know if that's coming out of a scanner, if that's coming from a, you know, convert from picture, if that is, you know, we don't know why, if it maybe it was something they authored in Photoshop. Don't know why, but it is still, I think, very telling that there are that many image-only PDFs being viewed today. Now, again, we don't know what people are doing once they open them. We could hope that they scanned something, they opened it up in the product to then go ahead and OCR it and improve it and something like that. That's something we would like to hope. We don't, again, we don't know. 
but it is interesting that it's that many. I then picked a couple of, of interesting PDF pieces. 12% um, of the documents had bookmarks. Um, bookmarks, we like to think, is a very popular navigation um, element. 12% isn't bad. I think I'd like to see it go higher. I love personally would love to see more documents contain bookmarks, but I think it's interesting. The two that I thought were, were somewhat shocking when I first looked at them, 4% with optional content, or you may know them as layers, 10% with page piece information, which is very interesting because it's a feature we just deprecated out of ISO 32000 part two. So my original eye action is, oh my God, maybe we shouldn't have not deprecated it. And then I thought about it and I realized why this number was significantly, was, was very high for us. So again, these are our products. Every one of our Creative Cloud customers gets a copy of Acrobat. Photoshop and Illustrator are heavy users today of the Page Piece Dictionary. And what most of our users do after they make a PDF is they go and they view it in Acrobat to make sure it looks okay. So I don't know, but I'm speculating that probably all of that 10% are files coming out of Photoshop and Illustrator. Okay, so I suspect if we could look at some other vendor's data, that number would probably be very, very small. But for us, for this reason, I'm speculating it's very, very large. But it, was, it, it shocked me originally, and I was kind of worried about it until I thought through why. And I think that's part of when you look at these numbers is trying to understand them and put them in your context. 60% um, of the documents were linearized um, or fast web view enabled. Again, I think that's fairly good. It's a fairly flat line over time. Um, you know, it's one of those things I'd always wished would go up, but, it, but most of those creators, if we go back to that list of creators, most creators do not create linearized files. Um, we do by default, a couple of other vendors do, but if you look over that list, it's not the, the vast majority of that list. Um, this one I put in for, for Duff and others. 18% um, of the documents were tagged. This is a, it, it's, it, this is a rising number. It's rising slowly, but it's rising. But I think more interestingly is not, as we started recently looking in depth, getting more information, not only is it tagged, but how is it tagged? What are, what's in there? Um, so I thought it was interesting. I put two specific statistics up. So of those 18%, so of the total set of tagged PDFs, 16% of them had lists in them. Um, I went back and looked. I forgot to put it on the slide. About the same number had tables. 33% had headings, either an H1 or an H. I use that as a fairly good um, consideration for presence of headings. Uh, I figured if I looked at an H2 or an H3, I wouldn't get the same... Um, information. So an H or an H1, 33% um, of the total tags. So that's interesting because, again, you would think that more documents that are tagged would have headings because they're structured, they're organized in some fashion, yet clearly the vast majority are not. Again, I don't know why, don't have the actual files to look at, but I put it forward, especially to those of you working in the accessibility and the tag PDF community, to perhaps give some thought as to why that might be and what we could do to work on that. 25% um, were encrypted. Uh, I, I'll point out three interesting ones for three reasons. Uh, I've never heard of them, which always surprises me when, when I see things I'm not aware of. And then the two underlined ones, and, and I don't know if, probably none of the rest of you will pick this out, but um, the first one, or the one in the middle, NeoView, is an illegal name because if you've read Annex E of 32,000, second class names have to be four characters in length and NeoView is a little longer than four characters. So that's actually an illegal identifier. Um, the second one is interesting because what it tells me is whoever WNJSEC is, didn't bother to modify the sample code they used to create their product because they used ADBE, which is Adobe's identifier. And it's clearly not from us. So um, interesting thing, again, interesting things you learn looking at data. Um, so I thought that was funny and thought I would share it. Uh, forms, uh, always a favorite. 22% of the documents that were opened, this, opened in April were forms. 
uh, so if you break down that 22%, I did this a little differently. So total documents, 19% of them, acro forms, 3% XFA. That's of the total, that's not of the 22%. Um, so interesting numbers, and again, remember, this is Adobe's product, so there's, some of these numbers are potentially skewed. We also are starting to look at what's in the form. So of the total number of forms, 17% had JavaScript. That's actually small. I'm, I was actually very surprised to see that only 17% had JavaScript in them. I found that a little small. Um, of those 17%, we went and looked at what type of JavaScripts were there. 21% had something custom, meaning that it wasn't just a user going and saying, give me a, I want this to be a number field, which actually generates some JavaScript. It was actually something custom in there. So some interesting pieces of info. Uh, we also have discovered that, and this is something interesting, that as you think about gathering this data, if any of you are going to do this in your own products, uh, when is a form not a form? Uh, so just because it has a form field on it, it has an acro form dictionary, it may not actually be a form, at least what we would consider one. For example, if you web capture a page that has a search field on it, that will give you an acro form dictionary and a form widget, but that's not a form, at least nothing we would consider a form. And then documents with buttons on them that don't actually do, th that aren't form related, like an interactive PDF, you look for the form dictionary, you'll think of it as a form and it's not. So some interesting things to think about as you actually try to analyze what is a form. All right, so this is some interesting stuff and it got me to thinking, and it's actually something we've been doing now for about a year, which is have we succeeded? Are we done? Um, my, my colleague Scott yesterday, actually in his presentation, we didn't talk about this. Um, although it sounds like we did. Scott said, is this the perfect document format? Are we done? You know, is, is PDF ready or, or, you know, modulo what we're working on for 32,000 part two? Can we relax? Uh, and I'm going to say no, we can't. So myself, um, Rick Treitman and Matthew Hardy, who are the other two Adobe representatives here this week, um, have been out and about talking to customers for about a year now. We have talked to thousands of customers around the world. Um, and what we asked them was not, what do you hate about Acrobat or Reader? That's an easy question to answer. It's what bothers you, what frustrates you about PDF, the file format, the technology, the container, the package. What is it about PDF that frustrates you the most? And we have talked to students and we have talked to government agencies, and we've talked to architects, and we've talked to lawyers. I mean, and you, you think about the range of, of customers that we have and, and also that you yourselves have and the, all the places the PDF are used. We went out and tried to reach everybody in as many countries and areas of the world as we could. So if I were to boil all of that down into one single slide, and I'll then go into more detail, but if I could boil all of their frustrations into one slide, it would be this. PDF is not engineered for the modern device era. And here's where we now get into the original topic. So, now, granted, this shouldn't come as a shock. We built PDF 23 years ago with a very different set of machines and a very different world in mind. And while many things have been added to the PDF language over those 23 years, the fundamental ideas and some of those fundamental concepts like a fixed page of eight and a half by 11 or A4 or whatnot hasn't changed. The true underlying concepts have not changed. And for our customers, and I'll explain what these really mean in a minute, that means it's not feeling like something in the modern era. Now, let's sort of break this down. We've talked, as I said, we talked to individuals, we talked to students, we talk to the average person on the street. What, you, what is it to frustrate you? It doesn't, when they read a PDF, they have to pin, and again, I'm sure all of you were all familiar with this. We have to pinch and we have to zoom to scroll around and navigate working on a document. It's not the way they read every other piece of content on their devices. It doesn't feel like every other piece of content. It's not interactive, it's not responsive. Now, 
all of us in this room go, well, yeah, of course not. It's not supposed to be. But it's actually interesting. We talked to customers who actually said to us, you know, it's really strange that I have to pinch and zoom to view this PDF because it's PDF. It should just work. And that's the way in their minds these people think about it. PDF lets them get their content on every device. They don't think about, oh, it's a fixed page. That's not their mindset. It's I get to take my content, I make it, I send it, and everybody can view it easily. Well, it's not as easy everywhere as it used to be. So, you know, very, very interesting talking to these folks, talking to individuals. Now, let's take this up a notch. What do enterprises think? Certainly, some of these things that we just talked about in terms of responsive and interactive are important, especially when it comes to building a rich, engaging document. So I'll give you a, a good example. We talked to a number of customers. Um, I'll give you an example of a financial customer we talked to. So the, this particular financial customer, they build dashboards for their executives. Their executives, so dashboard, they have to be in PDF. The executives only read PDF and they only read them on their iPads. And they have to be fully self-contained, disconnected. So using something like Tableau, going out to the web, not an option. Has to be a PDF, has to be self-contained. Today, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to build these things for their executives. All right? That's a lot of money being spent to build custom documents by hand. They'd like something that would automate that and would make for a much richer, engaging document. We talked to a, a, uh, a customer of ours in, they happen to be in Texas in the United States, um, who actually supply, who build custom dashboards for customers. And they give them a choice. They build them in HTML and they're really interactive and engaging and they build PDFs. 80% of their customers choose PDF over HTML. 80% prefer PDF. Why? Because they can take it with them, they can view it anytime, anywhere, they don't have to remember a URL, they can stick it anywhere they want, they can email it around if somebody else wants to see that data. PDFs, clearly the format of choice for doing this type of thing. Um, many other examples of this sort of thing that I can go through, but I want to point out one other area that we heard from our enterprises, and that is in the area of data. Uh, PDF, and you'll, you'll actually see this quote a little later, uh, PDF has been called the place where data goes to die. Um, it goes in and you cannot get it out. The data isn't given its true richness. We want, customers want to be able to get that information back out and get, out, get it out in a machine readable way um, so that they can do something with it. They don't just want to see it. They don't want to see a picture of a table. They actually want the real table of data. They want the equations, the formulas that went into building that table of data so that they can do additional processing on it. So very important. And, and certainly, we've made some strides in this area. PDF A3 is a great example of this, where there's an, a feature in the language, which we've now put into PDF 2.0, that enables you to not only put in that data, but are properly associated with the relevant PDF objects. So we're starting to make strides, but it's really not been exposed yet to the customer. Um, if you've never seen this before, the idea here, this is something called the open data movement, or this particular one is five-star data. It's actually something been promoted by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the gentleman behind the internet and the web, or the web, not the internet. Um, and you can see that PDF only gets one star. We're considered evil and bad when it comes to open data. And things like linked open data, the web, et cetera, get five. Turns out that we get a bad rap. It's not that PDF can't get all five stars. You actually can. But it takes a lot more work to make a five-star PDF than it does to make a five-star web page. So how can we get PDF up in that five-star position and get people thinking that it's a five-star solution? That's something we need to think about. We talked to government and education. What are the number one things we heard from them? 
their people are, mobile, they are, are more and more citizens in more and more countries around the world. And we're hearing this again, not just from, quote, third world countries, but from many countries around the world. Their citizens are mobile only. The only devices some of these people have to get them on the internet, their cell phones. That's it. That's the only way they can get online, which means the government needs to be able to interact with these people on their phones. Everything has to be mobile aware, mobile friendly. Okay, how do you get to them? And secondarily, something I know many of you are involved in, it has to be accessible. It has to be every single citizen of the country, every single, you know, in the case of education, every student has to be able to get access to this content. Now, again, in both cases, PDF works. You can use PDF in both cases. We know that PDF is, a, is, a, is and can be a wonderful accessible format. We have a whole standard, PDF UA, that goes into that. But, and I don't think anyone here would challenge that, it's really hard to make an accessible PDF. It's doable, no question. But it's hard, and it's harder than other technologies and similar technologies that are out there. And that's what we're hearing. You know, we talked to, for example, uh, one customer in the U.S. government gets 4,000 documents every day that they then have to make accessible in order to put out on the government website. 4,000 a day that have to become accessible. They come in as nothing. They come in as, you know, just some arbitrary PDF or sometimes a Word file from some other part of the government, and this one agency has to make them accessible. Think about how quickly they have to turn these around. If they're getting 4,000 a day, you're getting backed up very, very quickly. You know, for those of you who've done accessibility remediation, I don't think any of us want that job. I, I know I don't, certainly. Um, you also have countries like Canada. Um, I don't know if you folks are aware of this, and I know there's some Canadians in the room. Canada is actually ready and has, has notified a number of, of vendors, ourselves included, that um, they are ready to remove all PDFs from every government website in Canada because of the accessibility problem. We've actually been meeting, we met recently with the Australian government over a similar issue. Australia has long been um, negative about PDF accessibility and we've tried very hard to continue to push back and get them to accept it, but it's a continual fight. Um, and it's something that I think we all need to keep in mind. And, and I'm sure that you've heard this happening in other countries. So how do we make people not only recognize that PDF can be accessible, but it's easy to be accessible? And the lawsuits in this area continue to climb. This is just a, an example within the United States, although some of these are multinational companies. Um, most of these lawsuits happen in the U.S. because people like our lawyers, I guess, I don't know. But... You know, lots and lots of lawsuits going on constantly in education, in the industry, business, governments. Make your documents accessible or we're going to sue you. And a lot of these have been won. People are making money and documents are having to be completely reauthored and redone to become accessible. Industry influentials. As I mentioned, we've heard things, uh, Chris Prattley's comment from 2012, again, one of my favorites. Um, documents go to die in PDF. It's the Roach Motel for data. Um, this is one I, I keep very close and frequently repeat to myself as a reminder of things that need to be fixed. The other one is actually fairly recent from 2015 I thought was interesting. Um, this gentleman who is uh, very famous within the analytics industry uh, really loves PDF, uh, but as part of this article about it, he said it's not holding its own. It's not keeping up to that promise that we talked about at the beginning of exchanging information. And he even proposed a whole new format. He called the analytical document format, specific, specific for exchanging analytics data and data dashboards and the like. Because again, PDF wasn't holding its promise. We also have other standards bodies who are, if you will, attack, I don't want to say attacking us, they're not coming, they're coming, well, some of them are coming directly at us. There are some people on the committee who would like to see PDF die. Um, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Rick and I were, were just recently at one of their conferences and we heard two very interesting things. The first, the first was that the, every time a presenter would get up and they would present, they'd say, I'm sorry that I'm presenting in PDF, 
but it works. So they had to apologize that they weren't using their own format. The other thing we heard was there was a blind gentleman um, sitting down and he was having a private conversation. It was like the other side of the room. And all of a sudden he blurts out in this loud voice, they sent it in PDF, shoot me now. It was the craziest thing that this guy, like for him, sending something around in PDF was evil and bad. And to us, we think of it exactly the other way. So a lot of interesting things happening. But I will tell you on the good side, um, as I go towards wrapping this up, every, so we asked users, okay, you gave us all of these problems, you told us about your concerns, so what should we do? Should we replace PDF? Should we find something new and different and, and, and give you something better? Is there anything better out there? And every single one of these thousands of customers we talked to said, no way. We know PDF, we have trained our people, we have systems, we have millions and millions of dollars invested in PDF. We know how to use them. We can send them any way we want. We can store them the way we want. Our people have the tools. Do not replace PDF. We would like a better PDF, but we want PDF. And I think that is a very, very clear message that we should all hear, that we've done our jobs really, really well. We have gotten customers to accept and adopt and embrace, I would even say, PDF and all that it is. And that they don't want to get rid of it. They just would like to see some improvements. So what should we do about that? What can we do as a group? And so I want to put forth a, a proposal to this group and it's something I'm going to carry forward over the next couple of days. And that is that I would like to leverage the PDF Association and its membership to start a technical working group to try to solve some of these problems. I'm not saying I have the answers. Um, in fact, we actually, I know many of you do have some suggestions and some answers to many of these problems. We heard four companies present at the technical conference in San Jose specifically on a number of these areas. We have experts in this room and in this community in accessibility, in open data, in responsive design. How I want, I want to leverage that expertise and the expertise of our membership in the association to figure out how we solve this. So, I'm going to, so tomorrow morning we have a board of directors meeting and I'm going to go to the board and recommend this, hopefully, and this is my plan, and if, though, if you agree, tell me between now and then so I have your support and I can let folks know this. Um, to, for Adobe is willing to fund this technical working group. We believe that this is the most important thing we as a PDF community can do is to study this problem and come up with a solution as a community, as an organization that we can then take to the ISO for standardization. So this is what I'm proposing we do as a community, and this is the way it has to happen. It happens through the community, it happens through this PDF association, and then through the standardization process that is ISO. So um, thank you very much for your time this morning. I hope this gave you some interesting things to think about. Um, and as always, I'm around all day, um, and I'm happy to answer questions and talk about this or anything else. So thank you very much. Oh, you're going to take, give me some questions? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Leonard. So, yeah, do we have a question for Leonard? He talked about frustration, so maybe somebody that's a little bit early for Christmas wants to put his Christmas wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, but Leonard said you're the, he's here. Nope. Talk to him. Oh, Vincent. Sure. That's a great question. Um, I do think it's, I, I think it's urgent. I think it's urgent because we are seeing a very clear groundswell from the other part of the industry, from other parts of the industry that PD, that if we don't do something, it will start to erode PDF's position. 
You know, we're, as I mentioned, we're seeing this in governments wanting to take PDFs off of websites. We're hearing, uh, oh, I'll give you another example. IBM, you might have heard of them, small little computer company. Um, they are no longer using PDF for their documentation. All documentation produced by IBM is now an EPUB, specifically because it's easier for them to author accessible EPUB than it is to author accessible PDF. And so they have switched their entire publications process. And it doesn't surprise me to see others follow suit. So I believe that it is important for the future of PDF that we start this process now. In terms of when it can be finished, it, ha it has to go through the standards process, but I believe that we can use that process and use it in a, an efficient manner. So do I have a, a final number? Like, do I think two years, five years? I'd like to think closer to two. But it will honestly play itself out. I'm not in control of this process. We as a group, as a community are. And if we can get it done quicker, if we're all on board and we're all willing to commit our time and our resources to this, you know, again, if you believe like I do about this importance, then I think we can get it done quicker. If, if people disagree and that's okay, then it'll take a little longer. But it's not, you know, I'm not in control of this. The community is. So that's a, that's a great question. So, and and we, we split these up actually within the PDF standard itself. We talk about interactive readers and non-interactive readers. At the end of the day, I think it has to represent the fact that whatever technology we come up with can be used to do all of the things that people do with PDF today. It is PDF. It has to, customers shouldn't be surprised, is my feeling. That's not, so with that in mind, I don't think that it is necessarily the organization's job to express the details of how one would edit it or how one would redact it. But I do think it's important that during the development of any standard or specification, all of those are considered. Absolutely. I think that it would be our job to ensure that whatever is done has to remain fully compatible and, and in a model that maintains PDF today. My opinion. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, thank you, Leonard. So now we're getting ready for the five-minute race. Carsten is the first one, please. I need the help from the technicians and just a second. Yep. I have to. He, he said he, he has. He wants to take it off, so I'm going to go get it off. And then. Did you want to? Oops, you mean this? You want to uh, de? Because you told me I wasn't allowed to do it myself. <laughs> okay. This one is a little bit expensive. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. I I have my own stopwatch just to make sure that you're not cheating on me. <laughs> So I hope you're already awake from Leonard, but in case you are not, <laughs> then this will wake you up. A five-minute race, so eight members have five minutes each to present their PDF solution. And we did it because my last name is Zillman, so I like sometimes to go from Z to E. <laughs> so this is why Carsten is the first one. Huh? Carsten? C? Huh? Luratech. Luratech, okay. The other companies are all starting with A, that's why I did it. Adobe, Access, <laughs> Axayo. <laughs> So I wanted to, to switch the trick around a little bit this time. And Lura, take us the last one in this list of eight. So we have five minutes. I do the stopwatch and starts. I do it myself as well. Thank you. Okay, five minutes with a solution. I had to pick one. I picked one LuraTech solution that is out there in the market for quite a while. It's called LuraTech PDF Compressor in its enterprise version. And I want to give you a very quick um, one chart kind of thing. Has it all in there. Uh, overview of what the product could do for you. This is really about solutions, so I'm talking about the product. We offer with PDF Compressor Enterprise a, f uh, a tool uh, to fully automate it, on the server side, convert 
source documents of uh, different formats into PDF and PDFA. In an unattended mode, uh, automatically, it's a highly scalable solution helping you to just get the stuff done um, in, in bulk, let's say. So all the documents that might come in from a mailroom, uh, and that might be thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of documents in any given time frame, is it TIFFs, JPEGs, is it PDFs coming out of scanners or whatever, we can convert them and make rich content out of that uh, into PDF and PDFA. It can be PDF. PDF can be, as we just learned, 25% of them are scanned documents, probably, at least imaged uh, documents. It can also be vectorized. Uh, so uh, PDFs can be treated in different ways to be converted, for example, into PDFA for your archiving purposes. Can be office documents, can be emails that we convert uh, with uh, this one server-side solution automatically into the PDF or PDFA format. We do offer an automatic mode in there since uh, version 7 now. The automatic mode really goes down and uh, looks at every single page in there and understands what the page really is. It could be a vectorized page coming out of an office, so we keep it vectorized when we convert it to another PDF standard or format like PDFA or something like that. It could contain an image uh, on, in, in that vectorized content, so we take a look at that image and see is there some text on it, make it searchable to get the best content even on that pages, and it could be a page that is coming out of a scan, a full page image, then we can apply compression to it, we can apply searchability by OCR to it, and this can all be done automatically since version 7 so that you end up with a with the best and richest uh, possible uh, PDF or PDFA file as you need it. You, the output is, as I said, PDF or PDFA. There's a variety of settings and parameters you could use uh, uh, to get to that specific format and version that you want to have in compliance level uh, and so on. You can access that tool through batch mode. You can access it through hot folders. It allows and offers you job tickets to be integrated into server-side or mailroom-like or other uh, workflows. And uh, since uh, um, one of the latest versions, it also offers uh, um, an API to be integrated into uh, workflows seamlessly. It's a .NET API allowing you for uh, remote control the PDF compressor services from other applications. It's meant for, it's still, it's, it's very feature rich. It has a lot of stuff in there that is, uh, um, that we built in on, on mostly on customer requirements over the, it is 10 years, over 10 years. Um, it's very feature rich. Still, we made sure that it is a tool that can be rapidly deployed. It's a single installer. You can download it and install it. You can configure it, set the, put the job settings in there and virtually you have it up and running in a server side environment in about an hour. Customers of us like it. Um, and do it that way um, since, since many, many years. It's a very reliable product. Um, it's out there for quite a while, as I said. Um, people trust us with this solution. Uh, this solution is actively out there or in active installations out there in really thousands of active server-side installations ranging from very small couple of thousand documents a year all the way to several hundred million documents a month running through this uh, particular tool. Um, customers trusting us, uh, in the meantime, use it for their core documentation, like banking information, like the credit files in banks are converted to PDFA for archiving purposes and stuff like that. So it's really the core documentation, and I think you can as well trust on that product, rely on that product, and use it. People tend to forget about it because it's sitting in the server room doing its job, no complaints, no problems, and uh, that's why you should also take a look at that. It's has a free demo version if you want to take a look at that. And I'm almost running out of time here, not getting a warning from this guy here. Only half a minute left. So the other solutions that I can't go to, it's a single solution I have to pick. You can probably look at that in the different tracks today. Uh, we have a new product called Enterprise Rendition Server or, or Luratech Rendition Server, 11 a.m. track B. Um, Carl is going to introduce, as uh, Foxit, uh, from Foxit's side, the connected PDF ecosystem. I recommend to go there. It's something really new. If you say there's nothing new about PDF, uh, go there. You will see something very new. And my time is over. You read the rest yourself. I'm not supposed to say anything anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Carsten. Next one is ITEX, Stefan Engelin. So ITEX is one of our members from Belgium, so we also get a more international here. And your five minutes. Okay. 
Thank you. Morning, everybody. My name is uh, Stefan Engler. I'm the CEO of uh, iText. The uh, goal of my presentation today is uh, uh, to tell you who iText is, uh, but you probably know already who iText is. Uh, uh, what do we do and uh, what are we now uh, uh, working on as, uh, as a company? Uh, iText is a developer of PDF uh, software library. Uh, it's been founded by Bruno Loewagy in uh, 2008. I'm now two months within the company as a CEO. I'm replacing Bruno as a CEO, not replacing Bruno because he stays as a CTO and uh, as a founder uh, in the company. And we're preparing together with, uh, with the management team, Bruno and myself, the company for future growth. Uh, we uh, have our headquarters in Belgium, in Ghent. Uh, There's also our European office, commercial office. We have uh, people locally in Germany for the German-speaking uh, countries. We have uh, people uh, uh, also in the UK. Uh, for the US, we have uh, an office in Boston uh, to cover the US market, and we have also people in Palo Alto. And um, uh, in order to cover the uh, Asia-Pacific, we have an office in Singapore. What do we do? We're trying to provide value, like uh, I suppose everybody in the room, by enabling companies to make uh, their documents and publication available everywhere uh, and in the best way possible for the document consumer. And how do we do that? By empowering millions of developers to embed rich PDF functionality into websites, cloud, mobile applications programmatically. Why are we different? Uh, I think uh, uh, Innovation is part of the DNA of the company. When Bruno founded the company, he uh, developed something because he didn't find anything else in the market. So we are one of the first uh, libraries in the market. And today I can say we are one of the most comprehensive libraries uh, with a lot of features uh, uh, for archiving with the PDFA accessibility, with the PDF UA, uh, with the uh, pages for uh, digital signature, uh, filing and flattening with, uh, for dynamic forms, uh, we follow Sucfred for uh, e-invoicing. Uh, you can create links and bookmarks for uh, interactivity. Uh, merging and, and uh, splitting with the assembly. Data extraction for searchability and watermarks for uh, encryption. Why are we also different? Because we have a, a unique business model. Uh, we are an, uh, an open source company. We grew out of the open source uh, business model. Uh, we have a dual licensing pol uh, policy, so we have next to open source, we also have closed source, but 37% of the deployments or 38% of the deployments are, st are still uh, open source, and we will keep on doing uh, open source. We have about uh, 6 million downloads, uh, 5,000 commercial customers worldwide, and we are uh, present in more than 50 countries. Uh, we are uh, targeting the enterprise uh, as well as uh, ISVs who use the iText library to create solutions uh, into the market, and those are prime, uh, prime customers. And uh, why we are also different is because we are well documented. Eh? We have a high level API, we have an API which is, uh, and a library which is well documented because Bruno is not only a great engineer but uh, also a good writer. So he has written several books on iText on Action, which has been uh, sold and deployed uh, worldwide, uh, 20,000 copies. But we also writing, he's also writing other books which uh, are uh, on the website and downloaded 20,000 books. So, uh, and as such, uh, the iText word gets out uh, uh, everywhere. Eh? We are also active member of the PDF ISO committee, so uh, for future standards, we are also uh, part on, uh, on that uh, behalf. Uh, I'm referring now to the, this presentation keynote of this morning and also yesterday, because everything is about representation of information, sharing information, and about communication. Uh, and if I look how communication has been changed in the last five years, I think uh, I agree with the keynote speaker of yesterday that the PDF will grow, but the PDF will not grow by trying to put everything into PDF. I think PDF has to take value in this different value chain. PDF has a place and we have to find a way how that we can integrate PDF with other formats and other ways of communication. And I'm getting excited because when I hear also the speech of this morning and I look on what we are uh, developing within iText, uh, I think uh, we are on the right track and uh, I'm really excited uh, about the future. 
Uh, about the innovation, uh, I think uh, uh, the next innovation is the iTech 7. It's uh, not only an engine, it's also a platform. It's lighter, so it's modular. Yeah? It's great for mobile applications, but it's also extensible. So uh, we have different modules. Is it uh, done? Different modules available, and we're also going to change the business model to uh, give the development community the opportunity also to develop and deploy modules on the platform. Thank you. So thank you, iTex. iTex is also an exhibitor in the launch, and you can talk obviously more to them and uh, ask them since when they are a member because you need it for the quiz. Now we have Chicago, in the United States. Matt. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I'm Matt Kuznicki from Data Logics. On to uh, take an opportunity to introduce ourselves. Data Logics, we provide PDF technologies for developers. We've been in the field of electronic documents since our founding in 1967, back before the term electronic documents was even created, back when Woodstock and Jimi Hendrix ruled the earth. We were out there working with electronic documents. We've been working with them, wow, next year's gonna be 50 years of electronic documents for us. A lot of industry expertise, a lot of experience working with software developers, and seeing different needs change over the years, but keeping a high level of service and an ability to connect with developers the issues that developers see and face in creating their applications and bringing document processing to their workflows. We're an Adobe Ventures company. We're partners with Adobe. Um, in full disclosure, uh, Adobe does own a percentage of data logics. Um, in addition to uh, our own document technologies, we bring a number of Adobe PDF, uh, PostScript, and ebook technologies uh, to the developer market. Key of these is the Adobe PDF library. So those who want to bring the same PDF processing that forms the core of document cloud of Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat, as well as the creative cloud applications such as Photoshop, Illustrator, the PDF core that's in these products, we offer through the Adobe PDF library for your applications. You can share the same color engine, the same PDF parser, same PDF rendering, the same printing capabilities, same font technologies with the proven Adobe Creative Cloud and Document Cloud ecosystem. You can do this whether you're a C programmer, C++, Java, .NET, we offer interfaces for all these languages. Whether your platform is Windows, Mac, Linux, other Unixes, you can take advantage of the I would say two decades plus of PDF expertise that Adobe and Data Logics bring from the creators of PDF and from the two decades that Data Logics has worked with uh, Adobe with the PDF library. We also offer from Adobe a pure Java toolkit that we've brought to market uh, for Adobe, the, uh, the PDF Java toolkit. Those who prefer to be native Java take advantage of uh, the various pluses of a native Java uh, workflow in, in that environment. Uh, we offer a, a, an API for that as well. Uh, this does a number of, uh, has a number of capabilities, number of features, you can read about these. Both the Adobe PDF library and the PDF Java toolkit, we offer free supported evaluations. You can get advice from a real live human being. Uh, you can talk to us, we'll guide you through. Making sure that these toolkits offer the solutions that you need in your software solutions for handling PDFs. Feel free to reach out, connect with us, visit our website for more information to request your evaluation, sign up for our blog, Sign up for our Twitter feed, uh, join us on LinkedIn, or uh, otherwise reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Then we have Kallas now, where Dietrich is the new managing director. Huh? We should mention that. Thanks. No, that's the wrong 
one slide. I'm not Olaf. Where is it? I think you don't have time. I have. Okay, um, good morning everybody. My name is Dietrich, um, working for Colors. Um, I'm CEO recently, um, since recently. So, but um, I want to talk today not about myself, rather about PDF chip, a product that we have. Um, and PDF chip is about PDF creation. It's about high quality PDF creation. And uh, we invented that last year. Um, and uh, the, 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 the particular or the new thing about um, PDF chip is that it does use um, web technologies, HTML, CSS, in order to create PDF files. It's, uh, we, we, we want to make it easier to create good PDFs, so PDFs even for, for the printing process. It can be integrated into via command line, so it's not an interactive tool. It's been meant for, for automated, PDF creation. But today I want to talk about variable data printing, so how to create variable PDF. We've, in the great presentation from, from Leonard, we learned today that we are that the, the, the game is changing in a way, in a way, so how things are being published and all the web is personalized um, uh, by today. So how can we take advantage of that with a PDF chip or for PDF creation? This is a, uh, just a, a delivery note, and usually if you think about personalized PDF or maybe variable data product, uh, production, usually start with a template, so, uh, and so do we in this uh, five minutes. It's a template, and a template usually has some variable parts and some fixed parts, like uh, the logo of the company is fixed, and various data on this uh, uh, delivery note is just a variable. And our goal was now, so, um, and, and this is new um, in PDF chip, our goal was um, to make it easier to create such templates for use with um, uh, PDF chip. So um, you may, of course, just create an HTML template and use that PDF chip. PDF chip, chip would take off, uh, do the, the pagination stuff, so make, make sure that everything uh, shows up in the right uh, area of a page. But still, you would then have to create an HTML template. And we wanted to make that easier. So we thought, OK, people tend to use layout tools for this purpose. So it, when it's about print production, so they tend to use, for instance, Adobe InDesign. And they use Adobe InDesign to just do the positioning and formatting and to, uh, uh, yeah, the, like, like which fonts to use, font size, and everything. And, we, and now you, you may use InDesign, in fact, in order to create a PDF chip template. You, you um, uh, place all the content and you just use regular InDesign objects like a layer or so in order to identify whether a certain object is a static, a fixed object, or whether it's uh, a variable and needs to be replaced when you actually process and um, create your, your PDF pages. We've written a small plugin for InDesign that would then take that uh, InDesign content and export that into HTML and CSS and does also integrate with JavaScript that you may, may, will then need in the, in the third step in order to create, for instance, an invoice. And this, uh, by the way, is, is a, a, an InDesign uh, template that we deliver together with PDF chip and that can be uh, adapted to um, uh, a particular um, uh, um, uh, invoice layout. And this is the whole process. So uh, again, we are using InDesign to create an HTML template, and that basically uh, ends up in, in HTML and CSS. And then you may use whatever variable data you have to actually create an invoice or a delivery note or whatever customer communication you want to create. You may use JSON as uh, you would regularly use in, a J in the JavaScript world or a database, and you may even use a ZoogWord XML file and uh, uh, just connect that via a JavaScript that we also provide uh, in order to create from the ZoogWord XML your invoice. The template uh, uses three pages, so you have a first phase page, a middle page, and the last page for an invoice. 
So, uh, kind of a summary, um, you can use a professional and widely used pay, pay, uh, page layout application in order to create um, uh, templates. Um, and that, of course, makes it easy uh, not only to create the template in the first place, but also to maintain it and modify it whenever needed. You're using... Um, it's over? Okay. Uh, it's highly performant, uh, not as performant as my uh, presentation here, and this is just another example, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Dietrich. So he was talking about PDF ship, so, but Dietrich and I started the PDF A3 fan club, so if you want to join this, he has a presentation in the afternoon. Now we have the A companies, so I had a hard time to sort this. There's an AX now, access. Markus. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, these are the slides. Um, Leonard figured out that um, this morning in this great keynote, thank you, Leonard, that the number of tech PDF is growing slowly, but it is growing. And um, yeah, the growth should continue or even accelerate and we take our part access for we are focused on PDF UA on PDF accessibility um, our mission accessible PDF simply done and we are working in the fields of software um, services training and consulting and I want to show you some appetizers the first appetizer access PDF for word if you are working on a daily basis with word with Microsoft Word then this is your tool because with Access PDF for Word, you can convert your documents, your Word documents, to PDF UA with one click only. So um, you can empower your Word users to create a top quality P PDF. It creates PDF UA, WCAG 2, for sure. And um, we um, pimp up the templates. We, we save a lot of accessibility features in the Word template. And with this, the quality assurance becomes a no-brainer. So um, I love to let our clients speak about our products. And here we have some official recommendations by the Nordic Council, for example. The Swiss Department for Internal Affairs, the Austrian Ministry for, for Social Affairs, or the Uni University of Hagen here in Germany. Who benefits most? All word users, for sure. Um, who simply want to create PDF UA documents without being an accessibility expert. Next appetizer, access PDF quick fix. Quick fix is for finding and fixing accessibility issues very easily to comply with PDF UA. So you can save time during checking and remedi remediating. You can make PDF fully accessible and compliant the same with PDF UA and WCAG 2. You find accessibility issues very easily and you, you can fix most of them um, instantly with one click. One of our, um, I hear one of our clients um, says, access PDF quick fix is the best thing since the creation of the world. Okay, he, a little bit exaggerating, but um, okay. <laughs> it just does the job. I'm a fan. And who benefits most? All professionals who have to evaluate or remediate accessible PDFs. And the last appetizer, PDF UA monitoring. Um, we have a solution um, for checking big amounts of documents um, on the fly for PDF UA efficiently. So um, if you want to uh, to control, um, to monitor uh, your website or all your PDFs um, in your company. It's very easy with nice graphs and charts. And um, yeah, I hope you, you, um, now you have some appetite to see more. Come to our table desk and we love to show you some tricks and the products. Thank you. Thank you very much, Markus, and huh? you have one.
basically I have one more minute, but he's really an expert, especially also for Germany, for the accessibility. And now Olaf comes for Axayo. Okay, speaking of forms, fillable forms, if you have heard that uh, just about every fifth PDF file seems to be a fillable form file, I wanted to present a new f upcoming feature in uh, made to tag For those of you who don't know made to tag it's an extension or plugin for Adobe InDesign. Adobe InDesign can make tag PDF files, but not quite PDF UA conforming files yet. We help with that, so using make to tag you can actually create PDF UA conforming files, and you can do that in a very um, efficient manner, much faster than you could, would be able to do otherwise. I want to talk about that a lot today. Um, I wanted to have a look at fillable forms. Uh, in InDesign, you can actually cr uh, prepare for the export to a fillable PDF form. Uh, you have a couple of nice features. You can put text fields and list fields and, and buttons and what have you onto your pages. Um, you can customize what they actually do, what they look like to a certain degree. Um, you have a couple of interactivity options. Um, a few more things to design how, how lists should work, and what, what items uh, should be in those lists and so on. Uh, but that's it. If you look, just to, for, for the purpose of comparison, into what you can actually do with fillable forms, you could look at Adobe Acrobat, for example. And once you start looking at that, you find out there's a few more options and a few nice ones. So um, you have more control over the appearance of a text field, for example. You can actually pick the font that's going to be used, and some people are picky about that. Times, New time, times, times Roman is not always what you want. Um, and um, you, have, you have other options. You can ask for, for spell checking or not, and you can decide, decide to scroll long text or not, um, and, and many other things. Um, you, can, um, you have extensive options to design interactivity, what happens when, and you can even use JavaScript, something you can't do from within Adobe InDesign. You would have to make the fillable form first in Adobe InDesign, and then go to Adobe, Ac Adobe Acrobat and add your JavaScript or design your uh, JavaScript. Um, many more options, like the, the comb, like you have a, a fixed arrangement of the characters that are to be ended, which sometimes is important in, in finance or, or other fields, and you can define how many characters you have and, and that they should look like a, a comb. Um, uh, many other things, like maximum number of characters to enter, whether the field is actually a password field. Um, run the JavaScript, I had that, I believe. Um, and then formatting of, of numbers, for example, they have detailed control in Adobe Acrobat what the form should actually look like when you're using numbers in a field, like the thousand separator, or whether it turns red if it's a negative number, and so on. It's, it's very detailed control you can uh, have. Or um, formatting of other types of uh, information, like a date or a time, and so on, which you otherwise, at least not from uh, inside uh, Adobe InDesign, would not be able to define what it should look like, or that it, it actually is a date that you are expecting the user to enter. Um, and uh, uh, value ranges and, and number fields, uh, you can even do calculations, so you have a total, uh, you enter three items, uh, three numbers, and you want to compute the total uh, and, and show it to the customer that's using the font. And um, so many, many, many more options. And Today's workflow would be you create the form in InDesign because you are into layout and into cool design. You have to do that maybe in, 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 in InDesign. <coughs> you export your raw. Um, oh, no, that's what I was looking for. Uh, uh, you, you create a raw fillable form. You go to uh, Adobe Acrobat. You refine the form. You do all the, the, the touches that you need to make it really powerful and, and uh, rich interactive um, form. Um, and then you're done. But then there's a layout change. And then you have to change your InDesign file, and then you have to do another export to raw PDF uh, fillable form, and then maybe you have to do all the final adjustments again and again. It's a very cumbersome process. Using made to tag in the next version that will come out this summer, uh, you can actually reuse the enriched PDF, the fillable form that you've created in Adobe Acrobat, and use that as a resource for the next export to PDF. So you only have to do all the bits and pieces and the JavaScript and the formatting of the number fields and just about anything once, you get it right. And then after a layout change or redesign of the form, you just use that as a resource and make to tag will all, do all the necessary steps to carry over the enrichments from, from your fillable form that you created in, in Adobe Acrobat 
into the newly exported fillable PDF. That makes using InDesign for, for the creation of interactive forms much easier, much more convenient, uh, and it should save you a lot of time if that's part of your job description to do that. That's all for today. Ah. Thank you, Olaf. This was really for the second. Yeah. Now we have Uli or Ulrich Isermeyer from Adobe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the new uh, digital signature enhancements, which we did with Agrobi Acrobat and with Acrobat Reader, how it's called. The latest DC version, you see that we have a new uh, UI. You can switch it to a dark layout. We have tab views and so on. Those are the new features which we could just introduce in the spring release. Uh, what we are uh, doing in terms of electronic signature is a nice intro for the signature track, which you can see today, uh, because Adobe introduced a verification of all uh, IDAS or uh, util, I say util, you, you say EUTIL, so that's the European Trust List, uh, out of 28 countries was 160 uh, trust centers, so Adobe Reader and Adobe Acrobat can verify those signatures. You don't need an extra plugin with the verification is an, in an extra viewer like you had to do that in the past. So the new uh, law allows that, and uh, that makes it very easy because you can just plug and play uh, qualified uh, signature. Um, um, hardware uh, 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 machines on, on Acrobat and on Reader, on uh, both on Mac and on Windows. And uh, this is all uh, compliant to the new standard and we are updating all uh, certificates and we download the, the root certificates in Reader. So this is done automatically for enterprise customers. Of course, they can control that uh, with a customization wizard and we will support that uh, at the 1st of July. So we have that already with the former list, but the new one, which will be live 1st of July, will be <coughs> uploaded uh, 30th of June at, at night. So all users of Acrobat and Reader have that verification inside. That makes it much more easier to be compliant and have digital signatures verified inside this viewer and inside Acrobat. So um, what does it mean? Um, we also support the new Paydis digital signature format, which is also making those digital signatures compatible through those uh, 28 countries, which is it's all about the new IDAS law. You can hear that in the next uh, session. Uh, we don't only verify digital signatures, but we also verify seals. That's also something uh, with the signature law, the signature uh, IDAS law. And uh, we have, of course, uh, yeah, uh, not only the util list, but also the AATL, the Adobe uh, Authorized Trust List, and the CDS programs. So you can have a control and a verification of all those signatures. So how does it work? Those are screenshots from Acrobat. Uh, when you click on the digital signature, uh, you can see, first of all, that this is Paydis equivalent. So you, it's, it's marked here, what you can see. Uh, then you can see also the, temp, the timestamp authority. Uh, if you click further and you go into the validation, uh, dialogue, you can see that this is from the European Trust List and uh, of course uh, what uh, law this is according to. And it shows you not only that this is a digital signature like in the past, it shows you also that this is a qualified signature. And uh, there you can see that in those dialogues, so a user does not have to implement anything extra than just having the native 
Acrobat or the native Adobe Reader. And uh, that's for my five minutes in the afternoon at half past three. We will show uh, all about the document cloud solutions and Adobe Sign. I wanted to use a different approach in the morning. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> See you in the afternoon. Thank you very much, Uli. And then last but not least, but we're going to switch the company orders and it's Actino now. So it's Michael. Okay. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Carvey from Actino Software. We are a German company based uh, close to Bonn, the former capital city in Germany. Uh, a few words to my company. We are part of the PDF family since the standard was born early 90s. We usually act as a system integrator and value-added distributor for document processing solutions from um, well-known vendors like Color Software and also Luratech. And in addition, we also develop uh, missing pieces as part of a pro uh, process. So we developed more than 100 plugins for Adobe Acrobat to drive you know, different automation purposes and also other services. We also have some standard products uh, named in this uh, little brochure. But today I would like to introduce a new project which is currently under development. We call it Incremental Document Electronic Delivery Service. Long word, simple idea. We all agree that PDF is great. Maybe not as perfect as Len described this morning for every kind of usage, but I think we all agree that it's great. But it becomes a challenge when we have more than one file. So this causes management purposes for the submitting or for the supplying company who need to make sure that somebody gets the document, that somebody gets the current document, and that the people have an overview on what's available. And even for the receiving, receiving people, it's important uh, yeah, to, to, to get rid of uh, organization tasks. Things, so things get organized more or less automatically. So we decided to choose an improved concept for managing collection of files. You all know a binder, the idea of a binder, it's not you, it's well, well approved. So we will provide a white labeled binder application with a uh, user friendly interface to flip through the documents. We have tabs, we have a slider, we have bookmarks. So that's a very simple way to go through a number of single documents. This viewer will be available for the desktop and mobile devices. So, um, a corporate can provide different binders for different purposes and uh, the viewer will, uh, the people will view it in this way. Uh, there will be features to allow changes to the documents, also like, like annotations and uh, make your own comments, we all know from PDF. But the real innovation comes here. In case there's a new single document, there will be an automated synchronization process which populated the new document into an existing binder. And if you see the right, uh, the table of content on the right side, you will see in the first tab two items. So the, the end user will receive a new document into his binder, which maybe have been changed, maybe have been commented, and there's no replacing happening, there's an incremental update. So his uh, file remains, and the new content comes automatically into this binder file. So, what is it about? It's a new way to distribute PDF documents. We use modern synchronization technologies to populate the documents. Those files get automatically imported in the binder, so the whole management is done by the system itself. We have a viewer for all platforms. We can manage permissions, also write management features on any single documents. We have uh, features for annotation and for editing. And in the end, we, we of course have features to extract or export every single file from the binder to my desktop 
um, for additional usage. So that's, that's, that's what we currently develop and uh, I hope it's interesting for you. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. So this was a yeah, hopefully interesting race, five minutes, and now as it was a race, you need a coffee now, so we have a coffee break. And then like yesterday, this is a room plan, so this is a key for your afternoon. So then we go into the breakout sessions. Again, we have two German tracks, two English tracks. There's one special case in the German track is a PDF optimization by Mr. Rella, and this one will be in English. So if and looks like an interesting presentation. So enjoy the coffee break and then find the presentation you're interested.
Okay. I want to welcome you to this morning session on Wednesday. Um, we have here in total one, two, three, four, five, five tracks, uh, five, five presentations. Two one about uh, digital signatures. Um, that's one from, from me now. And uh, after me, uh, my presentation, Michael De uh, M Michael Demeyer from iText will give a more practical presentation about uh, how, how to use them in within PDF. And then we have a, a shift in, 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 in major topic. Um, we have a presentation about the connected PDF ecosystem from uh, somebody from Foxit software and then we have uh, also a, a, a practical uh, dem more demonstration about comparing documents. That means how, how to find the difference between two do documents in, on PDF level. And the last but not least uh, presentation is from a real PDF expert, inside expert from Matt Kuznicki from Data Logics about the PDF core. That means for the hardcore people who want to know everything about the inside, the, the, the core of PDF. Yeah, we will start with the, with the first session. I, I have the honor to give the, 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 this by, by myself. Um, you see the, here the title, latest news uh, from AIDAS and Etsy. And I can tell you, uh, this will be a very boring session. Uh, because uh, I'm talking about regulation, about laws, about standardization processes, and only a, a little bit um, at, at the end of, of, of the presentation about the, the real use of this or, or what will change. Um, I, I, I will try to, to, to give you also some background in, in, in information about what will happen f um, after the, this uh, um, date, 1st of July. Not, not the 4th of July, but the 1st of July. Um, because this is an important date, uh, especially if, if with regard uh, to EIDAS, because there uh, the whole re regulation will really take, uh, uh, will, will, will go in, in, into operation. Okay, let's start with this. What's EIDAS? EIDAS is an acronym standing for Electronic Identification and Trust Services. So it's not only um, aiming at uh, electronic signatures or uh, trust services uh, itself, but uh, also on the, on the main part of it is aiming at electronic identification. That means um, how to unify within Europe, within all member states, the way you, 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 can, you can use for identifying yourself by electronic means. The background is uh, Okay, it, 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 it's, it's uh, very, very, very trivial. You have 28 member states and every member state or nearly every member state has developed their own system for electronic identification of their citizens. It's very nice, it's, it's uh, more or less, it uh, runs well within a, mem a member state, but cross-border, hmm, it's more or less useless. So it, if you use your Belgium EID card, for example, to uh, make an identification in Germany, hmm. they will ask you, can you give me this on paper? Because it's better than the electronic way. There are, there are no means in, in, in the moment. And this was one of the uh, um, obstacles the EU has, has identified for the so-called single digital market. Um, and uh, one of the requirements was uh, that they have to unify all these systems or even to have to, to, to speak them to, to, to each other um, so that uh, they have a, the, the chance that uh, you can use the identification scheme from one member state in another member state. Um, the regulation is from 2013 from the European Parliament and the Council. Um, as, as you can see here, it's very generic about trust services and ele uh, for electronic transactions. It was published on, in August 2013 and since uh, this pu publishing, uh, there was uh, heavy work in the member state and at the EU about implementing acts because if you, for example, download this uh, EIDAS regulation and, and you read this and you are per perhaps a software de 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 developer or some, somebody working in the IT business and, and, and you want to really know what to have to do now, I can promise you, you will not know a, a little bit more after reading this. Because 
the, the EIDAS regulation has been written by, by lawyers, by consultants, and okay, then has have been reviewed multiple times. So it's uh, and in, in most um, ways very generic. And if, if for example, I, I, I made this trial, I, 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 I took this uh, regulation text and gave it to my de uh, developers who are de developing so soft, uh, software signatures and uh, uh, signature software and so on and other frameworks. Okay, here's an our in a new regulation. B, okay, look that our software is compliant with this. And then they looked with such eyes to me and said, eh, what's this? Really, this is very generic. There is nothing real. I, I, I can have a, a specification or something like this. And therefore, um, the, this is the, uh, in, mostly describing the uh, goals, what the EU want to reach. The, um, the, 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 the way to, to, to reach these goals are more uh, um, specified in the so-called implementing acts. And they were then uh, developed by, by, by some, some teams within EU and also in, in the member states. And the most important um, implementing acts um, should be ready until end of June this year. Because they really regulate how this EU regulation has to be applied within the EU. Um, and the official start of the EU-wide validity of the, uh, this uh, regulation is the 1st of July, this uh, famous date. That means uh, 1st of July um, states that uh, the national laws about signature and national regulation lose their validity. So uh, EU uh, law is higher than national law and, and, and therefore this is the, an important thing. Except, and this is mostly the thing, the typical lawyers, um, they say, okay, this, that, that's the, the, the law, except uh, if something is not uh, regulated within the EU law, the national law will be valid further. That means um, if you don't find an, 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 an important uh, fact within the EU regulation, but this is uh, regulated within your national uh, law, then this will be valid further again. So this is not simple for the people, uh, especially for, for, for software companies, uh, to, to fulfill this because they say, uh, what should I now follow, that or that way? But that's the situation. Okay, this is a picture um, I've taken from an Etsy presentation. Um, and yeah, the, the text on the left side, on the right side, um, I, I will not read this here, is all that direct, uh, directly taken from the original re regulation text from the EU. Then it, I, I've um, put this in, in the presentation just to show you that the most impact of the regulation is aiming at the so-called trust service providers. That means um, not especially on software companies um, or PDF com companies who are building signature software for signing, but uh, mostly for the, the, the so-called trust centers. In, in, in nowadays, they are called trust centers. In the uh, beginning of for, uh, July, they will be called trust service providers. Um, so that, that means uh, you have companies or institutions, they are offering services for, in, in that case, qualified uh, trust services, um, and they are in the ma major fo focus of, of the EU regulation. What they have to do, what they have to fulfill, how, how they will be certified, and so on. So you have these uh, basics in, in the regulation for qualified trust service providers and qualified trust services. For example, a qualified trust service is a signing service. That means, you, for example, you send a uh, document uh, to this service and you, it, it, it gets signed and you get, get, get it signed back. This will be, for example, a, trust, a qualified trust service or the issuing of a certificate to you. So on, on smart card, on token or whatever else, this is also a trust service. And uh, the companies who are doing the, or offering such trust services are these trust service providers. And they will then um, underlie a very strict assessment. So they have to uh, redo this assessment every 24 months. And, uh, this is, and they have to show that they are compliant with uh, summary regulations and mostly with ETSI standards 
um, and that they, they are fulfilling them in their daily operation. This makes it not cheap for the trust service providers, as you can imagine. So if, 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 if you face the fact that uh, you have to undergo such a recertification every 24 months, um, and this, these recertifications are not cheap, um, okay, it is, um, I, I can really say it is, it is hard to find a business model for such uh, uh, trust service providers that they can survive in, in the future. And we will see how many of them, how many of them, of these trust centers in the moment will survive in the next years. In, especially in Germany, we had an, a slowly dying process of trust centers in the last years. So in, in the moment, for example, we have only two trust centers left in Germany from, I think, five or seven a uh, couple of, of, of years ago. And most of them have, have stopped their op operations due to the fact that they say, oh, EU regulation, now I have to redo all the business, I have to redo the certification completely, new documents, new certifying processes, new audits and so on. A lot of money um, and what's the business case on, on the other side? Hmm. Yeah, therefore, they, the, the management has decided to say, okay, we will stop. Yeah, two left in Germany. Okay, um, as I said, in the moment, we have still a situation that if you have, an, uh, for example, EID in France and you want to use it in Germany, in a public institution, or so on, um, you, 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 you cannot do it because uh, you're really completely lost. They cannot very really recognize this. So even if both sides have the si same concept in, in mind, illustrated by, by the C, they speak with different tongues and there is no un un understanding. There has been a, 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 a small bridge by, by software companies, and I can say this by our experience, because we have implemented in our software the recognition um, of foreign uh, smart cards, foreign certificates, and, and, and so on. But this is an, um, what should I say, this is an, an offering of, uh, these, uh, of, 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 of our software or of other software. It is not a, a mandatory uh, in, uh, regulation. And uh, the thing is um, that you, you, you cannot take software A and software B and they, go, they both have the same uh, um, portfolio of, um, of uh, national uh, uh, certificates in, 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 in their own uh, software uh, um, map. Yeah, so it, it's also very difficult, also from my experience, to validate a signature, a qualified signature um, from a foreign country or from another member state. Also very in, in individual, and this was uh, the reason also for the EU to say, okay, we are one Europe, one digital market, this has to change. And they want to achieve a common an, an understanding all over Europe, the same in interpretation of, of, of standards, of common standards, so that, that not, for example, the Germans say, okay, in Germany we have the German signature law, and okay, there is an EU di directive from 1999, but this is only in informative. Um, the, 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 the binding regulation is uh, the, the one we have here in, in, in the German law. And this is also the mandatory thing for people coming from other member states. This will not be the case an, an, an anymore. They have to rely on common standards and the organizations who are producing these standards for the EU regulation are mostly um, two ones. One is SEN, yes, the European uh, Norming uh, uh, in, in Institute, and ETSI, the Telecommunication, Telecommunication Standards in, in Institute. Um, there is still um, a, a thing what, what, what will happen after an, an end of June that, for example, yeah, okay, we are only in that way. But for the rest of Europe, nothing will change. Why is EIDA important? As I said, uh, this overrules the national regulations and, uh, and also ma mandates a mutual acceptance of national EID services. We will see. This has to start, this mutual uh, um, acceptance with the beginning of 2018. That means when, when for example, in March 2018, 
and, uh, and uh, a worker from Portugal came to, uh, comes to the uh, city of Frankfurt in, in Germany and wants to off, um, make, make a, a proposal for, a, for painting a school or whatever else, which is allowed because there is one market. And, 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 and he is then asked, okay, he has to identify him himself and, for, for example, then sign this offer. Then he say, okay, I have here my Portuguese EID card. Where can I plug it in? And then the, uh, the administration in, in Frankfurt has to say, oh, you're welcome. You can take this card reader here, plug it in, and then tip, pin, uh, put, put, put in your pin. Everything's fine. That's a theory. Um, we'll see what, what will happen. Um, and I, I'll have some doubts that in, in the public administration, um, they can really um, make this until beginning 2018. Um, EIDAS makes um, as, as a, a framework for monitoring and accreditation of trust service providers. That means if you in, in, in the future um, say, okay, it doesn't matter whether a trust service provider like a trust center is uh, uh, um, certified uh, within Germany or within France or within Italy, you can take what, whatever you want as long as he is certified then you have to assume that you have a common level of trust in, in, in the EU. For, so, for, for example, I, I had the question in, 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 in the break, um, will, will it be possible in, in, in the future um, that uh, a public authority in, in, in Germany can use a certificate issued by an Italian CA, which is listed as in, in, in this uh, European trust list, that means uh, they fulfill the requirements of, of, of EIDAS. In theory, yes. Yeah, sure, you can. In practical, um, I think there will be a sort of, um, uh, can I really trust them? I, I don't know them, they are in Italy. Hmm. No, 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 no. Okay, I don't, I, I don't have any objections against Italians. But, but, but this is the, 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 the common way of, of, of thinking, especially in, in public authorities. But um, it, this, from the, from, from, from the, from the regulative uh, point of view, this is possible. If, if they uh, really have this also in, 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 in the, the practical lives, we will see. And they have introduced also some new co concepts of qualified trust service in EIDAS. Uh, for first, uh, electronic signatures, they are new, uh, they are old stuff, okay, but then we have electronic seals, a long requested feature uh, which is available already in some member states, but uh, if, for example in, in Germany or in, uh, in, in France uh, also, they have not supported this up, up, up to now. So that in, in the moment, if, if you are an organization, a public authority, and, and you have to sign uh, electronic documents with the qualified signature, every guy in your organization needs to have a smart card with, with a personal certificate on, on, on it. And he signs the, these uh, public documents with his personal name. And uh, this can now be changed by a so-called seal, that means the whole authority owns one certificate and they can sign with this one certificate which is issued to the whole organization um, their documents. And this is very, um, very good news, for the, especially for, for, for public authorities because they, they always ask, why do uh, Mr. Mil Müller has to sign with his name the, these documents? He, he cannot understand those documents. Yeah. That's a regulation. We have to fulfill this. That, that's law. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. Don't think about sense. It's law. <laughs> now we have, a, 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 I think, a better si si uh, situation that you can really t use these, these seals. Um, even, uh, as I also already uh, did discuss in, in, in the break, um, I don't think uh, at after 1st of July you will find in Germany, especially a trust center, who will issue them. So um, they need another couple of months until they are ready issuing these seals. But it, they are allowed for, for this. Then we have electronic timestamps, also nothing new. Then registered delivery services. This is not the pizza service, 
but this religious delivery service means these um, email services, for example, uh, where you have uh, an really uh, an, an, uh, closed uh, email system and where you have an uh, a, a, a improvement that the email you are sending is uh, received by the designated re receiver. In Germany, we, we talk about uh, the email and e-post, e and uh, there are other systems in, in the member states as well, and they are also regulated now by these registered delivery services. Then they have uh, also introduced website authentication. It was a very nice attempt of the EU to regain some, some part in, 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 in some share in the market because uh, more or less 98% of all uh, websites, so certificates are issued by um, American trust centers. And uh, the uh, European ones, they only play a very, very little role. And, um, but now the uh, EU said, oh, we will also re regulate this and then even the American uh, th trust centers who are selling these uh, things to European uh, organizations, they have to fulfill our re re requirements. We will see. Um, and, and last but, but, but not least, electronic documents. This, this is only a sort of um, dummy in the regulation. There is nothing further specified. Nobody really knows what, what this is behind this. There is one service uh, in, in, in mind, uh, for example, the, the long-term preservation of electronic do documents. So that means you, you have a, a regulation who gives you a, a, a framework for storing documents for a long time in a secure way. Um, but this in, it's still in he, un, un, under heavy work and, and, and uh, what is really behind this uh, topic, electronic documents. Okay, why is AI so important for, for PDF? As you have heard in the presentations before from, from Leonard and so on, the majority of, of signed documents all over the world are PDF documents. So if you sign some, something, mostly it's a PDF. You will not sign a, a word even if you can. You will not sign an Excel or something like this, or a JPEG or whatever else. Mostly, you will design PDF. That means this is the most important format for signing. Um, why? Because it's, you all know this, electronic paper, and you have the ISO standard, a very nice standard, and this is one of the, these, um, the rare formats uh, available who define embedded signatures, so that you can really put in the signature structure within the document itself. And uh, the base for all this are Etsy standards for signing, um, so-called PADES, the PDF Advanced uh, Electronic S Signature Standards, and they are explicitly referenced in the, all in the upcoming ISO 32000-2 standard. That means uh, in contrast to uh, the actual PDF-1 or 32000-1 standard, the new one who is expected, I think, end of the year, or beginning next year, to be published, um, there is an explicit reference to these Etsy standards. And, okay, PDF is the established format for electronic documents, and nothing new for you. Reasons for AIDAS, legally binding electronic signatures, are based on qualified electronic signatures. The qualified means mostly that you have more strict regulations on how to create and how to validate a signature. The, tech, the technological background of, 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 of the signature, whether it's qualified or advanced, is, is absolutely the same. So there is no difference. You, you cannot see directly only by looking at the signature structure whether it's qualified or not. Up to now, there was an indication, for example, in the German uh, certificates for, for qualified electronic signing, there was one attribute marking that this certificate for used for signing has, uh, is an unqualified one. But now the EU cancelled within the uh, regulation or the Etsy the necessity to use this attribute. So if it, it, it can happen now, beginning 1st of July, that you, ha uh, you receive an, a signed doc 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 document and you want to validate it, whether it's qualified, a qualified signature or not, and you look at the certificate, just on, on the certificate, you will not see any indication whether it's qualified or not. What you have to do is 
to have to, to make a, a, a look up of, of the certificate and an issuer in a so-called so trust list, whether it's a member of, of, of a trust list or derives from a nominal trust list. And if it's, this is the case, then it's a qualified one. So they have omitted uh, um, now the necessity to introduce a specific attribute for characterizing qualified certificates. This is not so fine because on the first glance you have no indication, but if you want to have unification all over the member states, they have handled it differently in the past, it's a compromise. Okay, um, Germany, is please, yes. Yes. And when you click on the signature, you can find out if this is a qualified signature from a trustless. Yeah. You can see it directly if it's a qualified one or not. Yes. So the, the thing is that, that uh, latest, uh, starting first of July, this is a um, uh, directly con con consequence of the regulation. If you have a validation ab ab application, as for example the, the reader is, is because he also validates a, a, a signature. Um, then they have to uh, um, use the European trust list as the uh, starting point of the validation of the certificate chain um, to show you whether it's qualified or not. So if the reader in this uh, example or the other software uh, you're using is finding um, a chain from the certificate used to a certificate within the European trust list and the national trust list, then it can say, okay, it's qualified. The problem is, as I said at the beginning, um, if you have, for example, a certificate which has been issued last week, okay, you know, no, <laughs> and this certificate has a lifetime of three years, you have to uh, validate it also after f um, com com complying to the national rules. Because there, you will see that, for example, um, it, it, is, it can be that the root is not part of this trust list or that it has this uh, um, attribute in, 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 in its uh, body indicating that I'm a qu qualified one and this attribute will not be there anymore. So you have to support both ways for a limited period of, of, of time. That makes it a little bit more complicated, but life is complicated. Okay, um, one con con consequence is also, that, as, as, as we uh, heard from uh, Uli, that uh, now um, the, uh, the, the, this popular application reader is uh, really um, uh, reflecting on, uh, on, 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 on the European standards for validation. That means in, in, in the past, um, the Adobe products have only used their, their own Adobe approved trust list because they, they use, they have installed this, um, this in infrastructure for, for the, the worldwide use and there was no specific uh, validation schema for Europe. Now they have um, in, in, uh, added the support for European trust list. That means um, you can now also validate um, a qualified uh, signature issued in Germany by a German trust sender, um, for example, with the, uh, with the reader. As long as, um, <laughs> as there is this uh, um, in inclusion of, 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 of the route used for issuing the certificate in the European trust list, but this is the other stuff. Okay, um, as, as, as you can imagine, we have a lot of standardization work to do at Etsy. And uh, this was the working program. Oh, sorry, the, the working program. Huh? No? Is there a movie? This is. Come on. Now I have a really good show. Okay, this was the working program of the so-called Mandate 4610, 
from the EU to, to Etsina. That means, okay, we have a, a, a whole bunch of different standards. Now I have to talk a little bit more fast to be in, in syn synchronized with, with the slides. And, and uh, I don't need this, okay. Why? Don't have any. <laughs> I don't need any an, an, an animation. One click, change. None. No? We will see. Yeah, right, you're right. Would be better. Um, this, um, these were the standards before, and uh, uh, Etsy made, made a structuring of, of this this uh, a whole bunch of, of, uh, of uh, standardization areas into these uh, seven areas for uh, trust service status list providers and so on, down to introduction of deliverables. And they also introduced a common numbering. If you ever have followed Etsy standards, you will get a little bit confused because uh, there are different num numberings, there are technical specifications, uh, European norms, uh, technical reports and so on. And you really don't know uh, uh, what is now the valid one and uh, what, what I have, have to follow. It's not, not very easy. They have um, reviewed this in, in, in the past and now you can see that uh, there is an, a more or less con consistent numbering scheme. That the, the big uh, uh, figures here are indicating the, the area, the, the, the major area. That means whether it's uh, transacting on signing devices, on cryptographic suites, or on signature creation validation, and so on. And you can also see here on, on, on this uh, picture that, for example, the standardization of the signing devices. That means, for example, smart card tokens, HSMs, and so on. This is not done by Etsy. This is done by Sen. And therefore, um, as, as you can imagine, you have two big organizations, standardization organizations. They have to synchronize each other so that one, if one of the uh, organization publishes a standard which is referenced by, by, by the other one, they will take the right one and also vice versa. Um, this is not very easy. And because they are com com comparable to big vessels, and they are moving slowly, and if you are on one uh, di direction, you cannot change this very easily. And everywhere where you, where you see this green check mark, uh, we have already standards. There are still um, uh, areas where we don't uh, have any standards published in, in, in the moment. So, for example, uh, a, a very f um, yeah, famous topic is remote QSCDs. That means um, the th the, these re um, uh, remote d d devices you, 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 need to, you have to use for remote or server-side signing. They are still not finally specified. Uh, there is no protection profile available. And therefore, uh, if anybody tells you um, he is doing Etsy-compliant remote signing, be skeptical, <laughs> because there is no certification for this, because there is no protection profile published, uh, and therefore there is no target against you can do a certification. Um, th th therefore, this is mostly marketing, and only a little bit truth. Um, okay, the legal framework you can see here. If, if you look at the AU regulation, you are invited to download it and read it if you cannot sleep in the night. Okay, it's up that you have a lot of sections and articles and so on. And uh, for every article, you have these implementing acts and so on. And then they correspond with the technical framework. That means the reference um, between the standards from Etsy and SEN and the EU regulation is not a regulation but the implementing acts. So you find the reference to Etsy standards in the implementing acts, and uh, that's the way it, it, it works. You will not find a reference to a standard within the EU regulation directly. Okay, I will skip this because there are a lot of the, the, the detail and information about what they or we have standardized in, in, in Etsy. Uh, for example, you, you can see here these EN, the European norms, which has been published uh, for EU-wide, and you have TS, which is published by Etsy di directly, but which, which is not the state, the status of an EU norm. Um, Etsy is uh, uh, the um, 
organization of uh, the, the telecommunication in, in industry in Europe, but they are doing standards not only for Europe, but for all, uh, all over the world who are willing to use them. So, for example, the most famous uh, Etsy standards are the ones for GSM, UMTS, LTE, and so the whole mobile uh, um, transmission and so on of our, for, for our mo mobile network is standardized by Etsy, not by ISO, not by uh, UN or, or other organizations. Okay, cryptographics, I will switch um, over. Then we have, um, these are the, 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 in, in, the, the standards you have to regard um, on, and follow if you are a trust service provider. So, oh no, not, not, not again. Next time, okay, I will, one moment. Oh, change, unclick, okay. In this, this area here, I, I wanted to give, give you a, a, a short overview about uh, the um, the EU norms um, uh, there for, from Momsen about uh, the signature creating devices. That means about HSMs and uh, smart cards and, and, and tokens and so on. And as, as you can see, only a few have been published in the moment. Most of them are still under processing. They are awaiting publishing and especially, for example, the um, part five of EN 419-221 aimed at regulation support, signing, sealing, remote server signing, and authentication. This is the, uh, the important standard you have to follow if you want to introduce remote signing or server-side signing. Not published, we are waiting for this and uh, we hope that we can have a publication beginning of 2017, but nobody knows. They are working a little bit slowly on, on this, so okay, perhaps it, it, it helps if, if, if you phone them or call them, say, hey, Come on, we need this. Okay, I will skip this because, um, yeah, this uh, is an overview. Signing PDF is re regulated, it has been regulated up to now in, in PADES. Which this was a technical specification from Etsy 102778. This has been replaced now since April by a, a European norm, the 319142. So if you have somebody in your company who is uh, needed to implement electronic signatures within PDF, they have to be compliant with that Etsy European norm. So there have been some changes um, uh, co compared with the old standard, with the 102778, and you have to take care that your software complies with the new one and not be compliant with the old one. There have, there have been a renaming of the so-called profiles, so they, they now call, don't call it profile again, but baseline. So you have the baseline basic, this is BB, just a signature. You have the baseline BT, that means uh, you have a signature with a timestamp, embedded timestamp. You have the baseline LT, basic LT, long-term validation capability, that means you have the signature, a timestamp, and all validation information from uh, OCSP uh, CRLs included within the signature structure. So it's self-contained. And the last profile is BLTA. This is a, a, a profile where, where you can re-sign your electronic document again and again to, key, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to conserve the validity of the signature structure for many, many years. There is still uh, the, uh, the, uh, there's still a, a, a part um, two, which includes the former profiles. So uh, if you, 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 you can still use them, but you are, it, it is recommended that you shift to the new ba ba baseline profiles, especially in Paydas. Upcoming is a, a, a proposal made by Adobe and with an Etsy to use pure timestamp digital signatures within PDF. That means you don't use a personal signature or a seal, but only a, a timestamp within PDF. We have already implemented this in our software. We are using this with our customers because it's very fine stuff to have the possibility to just timestamp PDFs 
and to then to verify that you don't have any pr um, change within the PDF in the last uh, time. Okay, I think now um, we are more or less at, at, at the end. I will skip this because, okay, as you see a lot of stuff. Um, just one, one, one last slide, um, server-side sign signatures. We have Im Im implemented these, um, these kind of server-side signatures since uh, two years now with the Swiss Trust Center. They are using this and they have made a uh, certification. They are complying with Etsy 410241. That means when we now uh, look at the AE regulation and, and the requirements um, that they can claim uh, in the next half, half year that they are compliant uh, with the EU re regulation, uh, even if they are located at Switzerland, and that they can then can really say, okay, we have this, the first one which is uh, EU uh, compliant and offers server-side signatures. It is um, a, a little bit more um, complicated to deep more in, 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 into this uh, uh, solution. Therefore, it would be too much time to do this. And therefore, I, I, I can invite you to, 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 to look at it uh, directly after the presentation. But for, for me, it was um, a, a thing that uh, we were very successful in offering this uh, type of remote signature to the market in, in, in the last months. OK, there will be a new initiative about remote signatures. I cannot tell you anything and uh, uh, any details because uh, we have, have been committed to say nothing about this. But keep an eye on the EU at the end of June and you will be so, so surprised about a new initiative com uh, con concentrating on remote signatures. Or even, uh, have, have you said anything about this? No. Okay, yeah. I had just a question about seals. Seals, yes. You don't need to, I, to, to identify the, 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 the person who has signed the seal. That's the purpose, yeah. <laughs> the thing is... That's a, the, the, prob the problem with this is um, the technology on, on, on one side. So it's very easy to say, I have a certificate and in, in, instead of putting in a, a, a name of, of somebody, I put in the name of the company. That's a seal. Um, on, 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 on this level, you will find it more or less in the EU regulation. Just change the natural person uh, against the company name. And then there was the implementing act. And how can we manage this? And they said, oh, uh, we have to identify the uh, company. How do I, I identify a, a legal person? Okay, we have to need an, uh, an, um, a paper from an from, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, authority stating that this company is existing, that they are registered, and so on, and so on. Okay, and is there anybody signing for this? Yeah, good, good idea. There has to be, to be somebody signing for, for this, who is responsible for the com company, and, and, and so on. Yeah, and then we are using that certificate just on a desktop, and he's signing with this an anonymous thing for everybody in, in, in the company. No, um, you have to use this in a controlled in, in environment. And this is all this stuff coming now. They have said, okay, seals, very nice idea. And then, okay, we have to look at the identification. This is different. We have to look at, at, at the operation. This should be different. Otherwise, um, there is no trust in, in, in anymore. And these are now coming with the implementing acts and the uh, protection profiles and so on. It is not so easy just to change the personal name by the company name. Yeah, but, uh, then I don't think that anybody would do this because everybody wants to know who was the company person. It could be the uh, or it could be the CEO. Um, mm, 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 I, I, I don't think so. So, if, if for example, if, if you have su such a public authority who is issuing uh, any um, confirmations and so on, you d don't want to, to know who has really signed this, but that the, that is an official stamp of, of this public administration. Or documents which are available as a download from the website, yeah. signed by this company, yes. 
Ja. You're right. You're right. For digital workflows and so on, where you have a directed communication, doesn't make any sense. But there are other use cases where, where, where they now have, for example, I, I, I've, I've talked to somebody from a health insurance, and they have 200 smart cards using at the scanning stations, so that they have to use personal smart cards. And on, on, on the other side, is this any uh, um, gain of in, in information and trust if you know which operator has scanned this? and signed it, normally no. You only need the, uh, the, the, the assurance that the organization is a reliable organization and that they, they stand for this trust. Yeah. No, no. They have uh, explicit. Uh, they, you can use. Sorry, they have, can use um, uh, advanced seals, or you can uh, use qualified seals. And uh, the problem comes with the, uh, the, the, the definition of the environment. How to use qualified seals? The so the the seal yes, a legal binding, but but made by an organization in contrast to a natural person. Yes. Passports. Yes. This is exactly the same. You need a process for letting someone use that company seal. Yeah. It's just as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, 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 you're right. There are, there are use cases where it, it perfectly, perfectly fits. It, it will not fit if you have a, a personal workflow. Correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I made a, a big fault as a moderator of, of this session that I have overdrawn uh, my, 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 my session time. Sorry about this. Um, I hope you had got some I, I, impressions about the, the, the new AIDAS regulation, what will change and what, what will happen. And I have to say thank you for for staying here and for listening to this very boring and uh, stupid and dry stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then I can hand over to the next pr presentation and pre presenter, Michael Demay or Demi? Demay. Okay. From iText, and he's showing us how digital signatures are really used within PDF. Okay. We'll see. Yeah. Just take this, I will, yeah. One moment, I will slide. Test. Play from the start. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, hi everybody, welcome to my talk. I'm uh, Michael DeMay. I'm an iText developer since four years now. You can follow me and iText on Twitter. Um, just drop us a tweet and we'll reply. So, this is an introduction to digital signatures and how it's done in PDF. So, a quick overview on the agenda today. So, first we'll look at the need for digital signatures. Then we'll look at how to obtain digital signatures, apply those concepts to PDF, and then look at a document workflow and LTV if we have some time left. So why do we need digital signatures? Um, there are three goals that we try to attain with digital signatures. The first one is integrity. Um, so you see here, this is uh, Eddie. Eddie has built a house and he paid his uh, bills in uh, terms. So every few months he got a bill from his contractor uh, in this case, one from uh, 30k euros, and he always paid it very on time, very st very stiff. Um, but this one time, he got a, an invoice, and he didn't check the bank account number, and somebody had forged um, the the bank slip, 
And he filled it in naively without checking the bank number, gave it to the bank, and lost 30,000 uh, euros. So integrity is about um, making sure the document, the content of the document, hasn't changed since uh, its creation. Next is the authenticity. So here you see um, Constantine I being depicted as a handing over authority to the Pope. This actually never happened. This is a forge. Um, and it was discovered only centuries later that this is a forgery. So the authenticity is um, making sure that the author of the document is the author, that we think who he is. Then the, the third goal, goal is uh, non-repudiation. So that is uh, it's a difficult word uh, just to say that the author cannot deny his authorship. Uh, like Bart Simpson, he wrote down his name in wet cement and he said, I didn't do it. Well, there is clear evidence that he did do it. So this is an overview of the three goals of uh, digital signatures. We have integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation. So let's apply those. Uh, let's uh, talk about some basic concepts to attain those three goals. One of the first concepts is hashing algorithms. A uh, hashing algorithm is a hash function that turns any kind of data into a f fixed size uh, string of bytes. Um, here's an overview of some available algorithms. Um, you don't need to memorize those, but take note of them. Um, yeah. So a use case for a hashing algorithm um, is this one, for instance. Um, say that you download a document from a server. You want to make sure that the document hasn't been corrupted by the download or changed uh, along the download. So what do you do? You download the document and you generate a hash from it. That's the AF1B, etc. And then the server also provides the hash. The, and if those two hashes um, are the same, then your document hasn't changed. If they aren't the same, yeah, your document has been corrupted or altered. Then the next concept is encryption. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the public-private key um, structure. So um, there are two ways you can use the public and private key. So for encryption, you use a public key to encrypt a message that can only be decrypted using the private key of the recipient. So for instance, if I want to send a message to my wife and I don't want anyone else to read it, I would use my wife's public key to encrypt a message, send it to her, and she would be able to decrypt it using her private key. Um, that message will be only be read by, be, on, be only be able to be read by her because she has a, the only instance of her private key, in the best case. Um, if we reverse that process, then we can um, use it as a digital signing, as a way to prove authorship. If I write out a document and I sign it with my private key, then you can decrypt it using uh, my public key, and then you're, you're sure that it's my document, that it's because you can decrypt it using my public key. So here's some uh, name dropping. Um, yeah, you don't need to remember all of this, but take note of them again. <laughs> And the third concept is um, certificate authorities, um, also known as CAs. So if we use um, certificates and public-private keys, that's all good and all, but how do you know that the person on the other side of your uh, transaction or communication is the person that you want him to be? So in this case, um, Alice doesn't really know Bob. So they introduce a third person, uh, Trent. He's a trusted person. He knows Bob and he knows Alice and he introduces them to each other. This is the role of a CA, abstractly. So this is a, a, an example of a structure of a CA. Um, at the top level, we'll find Adobe and below that, we'll find GlobalSign and uh, other um, certificates. Each level that is um, below another level is signed by the, the, the one above it so that we can um, guarantee that, for instance, Adobe knows global sign because it's signed with the Adobe root certificate. This is an example of the, um, of the chain of certificates. You might not be able to see it, but on the, on the right screen, you can see a chain of four um, certificates, which can be found here on going from the right left, uh, the right hand side to the global sign, to the Adobe root certificate. So if we combine those three concepts, we can attain um, digital signatures. Let's just go over it real quick. So the producer of the documents, he, he provides the, the document as is. He also provides the hash, encrypted using his private key, and he provides his public key. 
then the consumer, the recipient of the document, he creates the, the, the hash from the original document that the producer provided. He decrypts the hash using the public key also provided, and he then compares them. If they are the same, the document has not been al altered. If they aren't, the document has been corrupted or modified. So are the goals met? Yes. So the integrity goal is met because the hashes should be identical. The authenticity is met because the certificate authority information is inside uh, the public key. Um, and the non-repudiation is also um, provided by the infrastructure of the public-private key pair. So now let's take those concepts and apply them to PDF. Um, you should know a few of these standards, um, at least the first one. <laughs> Um, so, one of the most uh, important uh, standards concerning uh, digital signatures is the PADES um, standard. There are six parts of two PADES. Uh, we're going to delve into just one uh, today, four at the end of the presentation. So, um, this is a short overview of the syntax of a PDF file. Um, the, the pink area is a digital signature. That, that's a signed hash, it, so it doesn't include the, the pink area because how can you take a hash of something that doesn't exist yet? So a digital signature um, actually contains everything but the, the pink area, just so the blue areas are inside the digital signature. And also the concept to just sign page per page in a PDF doesn't exist because you take the entire document and then you sign it. Okay, so what's inside a PDF uh, a signature? So at minimum, you should have the, the bolded parts, so the, the hash, and a certificate, the signing certificate. Um, but the best practices are the entire blue um, rectangle, so you should include the chain, the revocation information, the CRL and an OCSP, and a timestamp. But that's, in the, that's the best practice. Okay, um, so now we're going to look at a workflow. Um, you might not know, or you might, um, but PDF can have revisions. Uh, normally, a file would end at the end of file marker, um, but in PDF, you can add additional content behind the end of file marker, as long as it's valid PDF syntax, and if, if it's ended by an, an another end of file marker. So this also means that you can add additional digital signatures to your document. Um, so this also implies that revision three signs the previous um, revisions because it's valid PDF content and it's the signature should contain everything but the digital signature uh, container. So we have two types of signatures. We have certification signatures. You can see uh, on the top the, the blue ribbon. That's the representation in Adobe. Um, and it's only possible for the first uh, revision. Um, you can set some modification uh, permissions to allow disallow changes, uh, form filling, uh, signing. Um, this is usually the first, the author signature um, in the document. In um, later revisions, you can add approval signatures, also called recipients. And in P PDF 2.0, you can set the, the permissions as well. And that's the, the green check mark that we all know and love. Um, there are some other icons in uh, Adobe Reader. So you have the, 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 the yellow triangle with the exclamation mark. And that is usually an indication that something is um, unknown or um, yeah, something happened, but not that corrupted the message, uh, the, the PDF. So in this case, um, we don't know who the author is, but the PDF is still valid. It's, it hasn't been modified since the uh, signature was applied. And the red cross is the, the most lethal one to signatures. It means that at least one signature has been broken. Um, and you should look into your PDF files. So this is a very basic workflow um, document that uh, this, uh, displays uh, the use of uh, signatures. So Alice is a certific certification uh, signature. So she's, she signed the, 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 the document and she left a little text for Bob, for approval by Bob. Everything is in order, as you can see. And then Bob gets the document. He signs it. Read and approved by Bob, he filled out the field and he signed it using his uh, certificate. And then he sends the document to Carol. But Chuck intercepted the document. Chuck is the evil employee. 
and he changed a uh, text field here. I don't know if you can see it, but where it used to say uh, read and approved by Bob, it now says changed by Chuck. This breaks the, um, the signature because content has changed. You can see it here by the red cross um, at revision two. I, I'm a bit too short for that. So um, there's a visual indication that the document has been altered. Luckily, we have an, an older version, the correct versions. So now we send it to Carol, she signs it, and she um, moves it on, uh, sends it on to Dave. Dave also signs the, the document and then puts it on his file server. But then Chuck comes back again. Somebody should really fire this guy. And, um, but now he changed the same thing again. Um, and he broke two, two versions, as you can see. So that's the incremental aspect of PDF signatures that we explained a bit earlier. So if you break an earlier version, the, the later versions uh, also break. Oh, okay. So um, now we're going to uh, talk a bit about LTV, long-term validation. Oh, yeah. So certificates expire. After a certain date, a certificate expires, as indicated by the vertical bar. And they also get revoked. A revocation can happen when a, an employee leaves the, uh, the, the company or when, uh, for instance, uh, certificates get, get gets compromised or stolen. Um, then they get re revoked before the expiration date. And it should not be used, of course. Um, so how do we solve this? Um, we add a CRL or an OCSP. A CRL is a certificate revocation list. It's a list that your CA uh, maintains for you, and it it's just a listing of all the certificates that are revoked on a certain level. And an OCSP is an online um, certificate status uh, protocol, and it's a very small check um, that uh, your CA sends to you. So you send a check to the, to the CA, and um, the CA sends a reply, yes, this certificate is still valid or it isn't. Um, as you can see, this is uh, indicated in Adobe Reader by um, too small, but the CRL was signed and um, the OCSP was signed by. So we can include those in the document to make sure that the, the certificate was still valid um, when signing this document. So um, CRLs and OCSP, uh, CRLs can uh, be applied to uh, any level. Um, so one level contains a CRL of all the um, revoked certificates on a lower level. Um, your CA should have a very good structure to handle this, um, because if, if you put all your certificates on the same level, then your CRL list gets, gets very big and um, un unmanageable. So how do we survive revocation and expiration? Um, yeah, so we add a timestamp. It's uh, quite simple. So a timestamp is, is a signed timestamp, and you add it to the document to prove that the, the revocation and the OCSPs were still valid at the time of signing. Um, here we used the, the Psycho timestamping service, um, and you can see that the timestamp has been added. So what to do when at the time of signing or later there is no CRL or OCSP available or a timestamp, um, or if your document is about to expire, uh, your certificate is about to expire, or for instance, the, the, the algorithms are about to be deprecated. We add a document security store. It's um, additional information that we add on the um, certificates, OCSPs, and val uh, verification information uh, after the end of file marker. Just like the re revisions that we saw earlier, we add information behind the, um, the end of file marker. And then we timestamp it to tie the DSS, the document security store, to the document uh, to make sure that the information was valid at time of uh, adding this. So, but of course, a timestamp can also expire, so we have to redo this every time your certificate of your timestamp uh, certificate will expire. So, your but your document management system should be able to handle this. I say should, but it should be able to. Okay. So, if there are any questions, you can ask them now or at the booth later. Um, you can contact us using uh, the sales um, contact addresses. We are based in Singapore, Belgium, and the US. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I thought we were running late. Yeah, by, by yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, but the open source version. So um, I wanted to keep it uh, as agnostic about any SDK implementation as possible because it's an introduction to um, PDF and signatures in general. So, um, but everything I showed you can be done with, with iText and um, every screenshot that you saw is a PDF generated with iText or modified by iText. Um, so I'll just grab back to this slide. Um, so, so yeah, here. You mean if you want, you want to exclude some information from the byte range, that is possible, but it's not advisable. Um, so the, the specification says that it's best to keep it li like that. Uh, it's not allowed. Yeah, not in Pades. Yeah. It's technically possible, so. <laughs> it's a language of the specification. <laughs> yeah, but, but you shouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, so, I sh uh, so that's the certificate chain that I showed you earlier, um, all the way back to the CA. CA. So it's, um, it's this, this. So um, for instance, the, the, the certificate that I used was in, in, in this part here. So the chain would be this, this certificate, this certificate, and this certificate. So in the optimal case, you would add all the certific certificate chain to the signature. Okay. Again, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you for listening.
And my next question is, um, who uh, here is a, another vendor and who here is, well, not a vendor, you know, just the, the hand up to give me an idea. And the reason for that is um, it's not a competitive um, question to answer, it's just so I know who's a real expert and, uh, and make sure that I tailor my presentation accordingly. So as it stands right now, no one uh, here appears to be, oh, there's one, uh, and another one. Okay, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Still, I can see more than 50%, uh, probably 60. So as, as we say, or as is written here, um, connected PDF, the future of, of PDF has already begun. And I know a lot of what we've been looking at so far has been looking at the previous use of PDF and how we got to this point. Um, a little bit about me, I'm not really going to go into any of the detail um, other than just uh, I've been working with PDF going back to, um, I think it must be, well I finished probably 1995 and before that I was still, uh, 1995 was when I was working only with PDF, that was a, a new company of my own and I've been doing that since then. Uh, prior to that, I was still working with PDF uh, at a bank, and what we were doing is um, building some software that took your bank statements and converted them across to PDF. And that, that's kind of what got me into the whole thing. As, I, as I've said here though, more than anything else, what I do love is to get together with, uh, I've called them PDF aficionados, and these are all the others out here who, I wouldn't say just love PDF, but love finding a way to use PDF to solve uh, solutions and problems that we have out there. To give you an idea, uh, who's heard of Foxit before? Okay, who's not heard of Foxit before? Well, that's funny because most of you, uh, yeah, okay. Well, just in case, just in case you haven't, um, Foxit, has, um, and th this is probably the number you're not familiar with, um, 300, 300 employees total, and actually 200 of those are all developers. So when it comes to doing something more significant with PDF, that's where we're coming uh, from, that's what we're focused on internally, and if you haven't heard of us before, that's because most of the work that we've been doing is on development, and you're not gonna see that in the future. Now, if I ask that question, you'll say, yeah, of course I've heard of Foxit, because they're out there to help um, take PDF and build PDF um, further. And I don't, I, I'm not talking about this in a, a, a private sense. Uh, Leonard has just uh, walked in, and I had a conversation with him before. What we're talking about is how can we join those who are working with PDF and make sure that in uh, a year, two years' time, that we end up with something that's likely to go for 10 years, 20 years' time. Oh, sorry, I missed the one point there. Um, in order for us to be successful in what we're looking forward, we need to make sure that we have a, um, a really large um, base, if you like, of users who are out there who can then take advantage of what it is that we're putting on the table. So 425 million is what we have so far, and I'd like you to consider that as just being the start of where we intend to go. Um, history of PDF, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that. Um, you know, hundreds of billions later than 23 years ago. What I will mention though, is that there's a, like whilst we have a whole lot more PDFs right now, what we also have is a document deluge. We have uh, a mess of different PDFs. I know even, um, if I compare it to Microsoft Word in preparing uh, a few items that I was yesterday, um, I had 12 different versions of Microsoft Word and I wasn't actually sure which one was the real, real one. I shot one off to uh, Rowan, he put some comments on that, came back to me, and it just left me with that, that uh, quizzical um, thought of needing to do something about large collections of documents and seeing how we can do that. Um, control and tracking of those same documents, so when you're working together in a team, how do, how do I make sure that when I send it over to Roman, uh, sorry, uh, Rowan, although I think Roman is actually further down here in the audience, how, how am I sure that I'm able to track what he's doing? Um, 
Bang, 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 uh, recall, sanitize, update, and regulate today's PDF. More control over uh, what we're doing. And again, just so you, you're clear, I'm talking about from a business perspective. This isn't if my grandmother releases a, a PDF or anything like that. Um, not that she does that that often, but, you know, just in case. So where um, I consider PDF to be at the moment, for the most part, it's a passive format. We don't see large amounts of interaction um, that I think, or interaction and control that I think we're really going to need for the future. Um, some quick more stats here. Again, I'll, I'll uh, just say them quickly. 21% uh, productivity lost, 81% employees who've been running around with the wrong document, uh, 3.5 uh, million lost uh, productivity. Uh, per company, and here's the big one, I mean 3.5 isn't anything that's going to make you uh, cry if you own the company, but 267 billion profitability lost, and the interesting point there is uh, when we calculated that, that's in the US alone, and you might be able to tell from my voice, that's not where I live, right? So if I go and look around, bang, what's it like in Australia? Um, Another, uh, I can see another guy down the back, uh, Roman, what's it like in Slovakia? Over there, what's it like in uh, Britain? A big number is what we're talking about. So let's look ahead. Um, and in coming up with this idea, uh, John Lennon was, was uh, where we got this idea from, or where we got the, um, the feeling from um, as to how we can look forward and solve this problem. So first up, imagine a, a digital document um, that knows its location, or rather, sorry, that you can know its location, um, like, a, like a beacon. Imagine that you have a document that can be read by the recipient, um, changed or, or, or printed, sorry, but the author of that document would know what's happening with that. Again, so if you think back to what I was saying before, we're talking about managing um, and controlling that set of documents. Um, changing uh, and distributing automatically new versions of the document. So um, if you're looking at the latest version of uh, a manual that you might be sending out to customers, what happens when you've got a new one that marries up, but they're still sitting with the old one and, you, and you're not getting anywhere? That's what we're looking at here. And this one you've probably heard before, it's the idea of having an outdated document and then bang, you want to get rid of that. An example for that, if you're thinking of it, would be um, you have some staff in a controlled environment. One of them uh, is uh, has left, either voluntarily or involuntarily, and then that's it. Document is just signed off. And you'll be able to see in uh, a little while, I think, are you showing, are you showing the signatures, uh, Wim? Not during this session. Okay, not during this session. But uh, afterwards, if you want to see them, just come up and we'll give them a look. So question here, um, what if we connected our PDFs, okay? So not um, a deluge, but uh, a, connected, um, a connected collection of PDFs that's suitable for management within that business environment. Moving back to the keywords here that I think of, it's disruptive and deluge. So we're looking at how can we use this disruptive technology um, to revolutionize the industry. Sorry, when I said disruptive, I was thinking of the documents. What we mean by disruptive is disrupting the way that, let's say, the world works with PDF at the moment. Um, there's new levels of, and I'll just go bang, 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 accountability, collabor uh, collaboration, and productivity. Again, keywords of what I mentioned before, and something which demonstrates to you how we can be effective. Um, creation, sharing, and tracking of those documents, all tied in. And then lastly, and I think this is uh, really important, and um, Leonard, when I was talking with you before, this is, uh, you know, we're looking, and it's very important to see that we um, allow extension in this area, as you've pointed out, to make sure that the um, users even outside the system are able to deal and interact with these sorts of PDFs. It's not a matter of, oh, we'll open up one of those uh, Foxit um, PDFs and you don't get anywhere. Uh, prying eyes, uh, keeping everyone on the same page. I'm not going to go into this because I've kind of verbally ex uh, explained it. 
coord uh, coordinating your comments. Oh, this I will mention, the, the whole concept. Who's used um, Google Docs Word? Yeah? So the feature that you have within Google Docs where it's like I start typing, um, Rowan's, say, using the other one, bang, 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 um, that one pops up all at the same time. I find that extremely useful, and it's the sort of thing that I, I um, you know, I really believe is a very effective add-on or part of um, a new piece of software, let's say, that relates to PDF as something which is normally um, the, <coughs> what would you call it, like it's at the end, yeah, final format, sorry, yeah, that's correct. Having that interact, um, having the possibility to take advantage of that, um, that's a, a really impressive uh, feature. So here I'll give you the quick walkthrough. I'm not sure what that... All right, so start with any document, uh, convert it to a connected PDF, and using the, the Foxit environment, that's just bang, a, a, a one-step process. Um, the metadata that you um, manage, it's actually restore, uh, stored in the cloud, so we don't embed this inside the document. The document's all cool. This um, information that provides um, detail as to how everything is managed is done so um, at the cloud level. Um, yeah, unique connected ID. So sending the document out and knowing now that we have those um, or have that control over it, that's what I was talking about before. That idea of now I don't have a deluge of, uh, you know, I don't know, I think you said 2.3 trillion, but I believe last year Phil had said up to 4 billion. So 2.3 to 4, or was it trillion? Trillion, trillion. yes, yeah, sorry, billion's not that big. So um, trillion up to billion, and that's a really substantial number of documents to be working with. Um, when you're working with the order, uh, ordinary documents, they have a, a simple message. If you open up the document outside of Foxit, so in any other PDF-related application, letting you know that you need to take a different road um, in order to get access to what's now... Uh, it has that control that I was mentioning. So at this point, um, what I'd like to do is to show you a real demo of how it works. You've heard a lot of... Um, blubbery from me, a little demonstration, but I think there's nothing better than actually seeing it live. So, uh, Wim, if you'd like to, to jump up. Sure. <coughs> Do you want to... Yeah, oh, you've got another one? No, I think... Okay. Just uh, yeah. Sorry, just bear with us while we move this. Well, <laughs> it's very expensive. Beer. So a little bit of uh, photo material, so hang in there. So what I'm trying to do, as Carl mentioned, is um, I'm going to show you the, uh, you know, the way we work with connected PDFs. Um, I'm using uh, Foxit Phantom, um, our latest and, uh, and greatest uh, version, which, uh, which support this. So that's the, the first part. And I will also be using a, uh, a document, which I will be converting to a PDF, do some commenting, and then, you know, see how all works uh, works together. So, you know, uh, we will have three users on, uh, on the system um, who will be commenting on this particular report. There will be somebody who works in finance and there will be somebody who works in marketing. 
It is important to understand that uh, the guy who works in marketing, hold on, just gonna show my phone here. The guy who works in market, uh, in finance, I'm sorry, is um, on the road. So he's gonna work on the PDF and comment on the PDF via his iPhone, okay? On my iPhone, there is uh, an app which is called Mobile PDF for Business, which supports the connected uh, ecosystem already. Myself, as I said, I'm using uh, Foxit Phantom to start and, and you know, create the document. And then we have the marketing user who will be using our Foxit Reader for Mac um, on, his, um, on, his iOS, uh, on his iOS, on his OS device, I'm sorry. So first things first, what are we going to do, obviously, is create the, the PDF. So I'm in Word right now. Uh, I have the annual report, and I'm going to hit the uh, Create PDF button. At that moment, it's going to ask me to save it, so I'm going to just save it on, uh, on the desktop, give it a name, and here we go. So in a few seconds, when that uh, document has been uh, created, uh, it, will, uh, it will be opened in, uh, in Foxit Phantom, and we can start moving on and actually um, use the Connect app. I hope the screen is big enough for everyone. Um, and start using the uh, Connect uh, tab to um, you know, do some things. And one of the, the first things I want to do, uh, for instance, is enforce tracking. Enforce tracking, uh, as Carol mentioned, is going to be able to um, you know, use that little beacon and just say what happened with the PDF file, uh, who looked at what page, who commented, and so forth, and so forth. So if you enforce tracking, you're really going to be able to see if you send out the documents to, you know, externally and internally, who did what on the particular uh, file. The second thing I want to do, obviously, is uh, apply some DRM and protect uh, the document, okay? So if I now uh, click on protect document, I'm going to be able to, uh, to set some, uh, some permissions. Takes a little bit, yeah. Okay, so I'm using a, a beta version at this point in time, and we might have a little bit of a, of a hiccup here, which is okay, I think. So let me go back here, and then I have the annual report. I double click it, and I'm just back. Go to the connect. Oh, okay, I lost my network. So you see that's the GLS event uh, network, which really is not a good one. And I lost yours, uh, Carl. So the problem is obviously of a connected system, uh, it makes sense that you have a network. If you don't have a network, you know, it not, cannot connect to the server. And we had one, but uh, Carl's phone just, uh, just broke down or something happens. And the Wi-Fi network here, as we all saw, is not really on par with uh, today's standards. So hang in there for, uh, for a second. Which is it? Android up, yeah. Low B. You should be able to pack now. OBSP. Is it the same or what? Is it the same speed then? Yeah. No. And there we go. So let's hit that protect button again and see if we can connect to the server or not. Okay, good. So actually what you see now, if, uh, if we have that connection in place, and thank you, Roman, we can start configuring uh, the permissions, right? So hit the uh, configure permissions uh, button and it will bring me to a screen where I'm going to be able to, um, you know, to, to configure the permissions and what are people allowed to, uh, to do and, uh, and not to do. Something's going on, not sure what. Okay. View permissions, so you can choose one of the two. I'm going to configure them now, and now we got the screen. So, as I said before, we have one user who's the finance guy, right? We add him. Now he's already 
you know, on the system, on the, on the platform, and we're going to give him rights. So we can give him read rights, we can give him copyrights, we can go a little bit advanced and, you know, say that he can print. So actually it's just, you know, saying what he can do with that particular file. So <coughs> for the sake of uh, the demo here, I'm going to give him only read rights um, so that later on he will ask me permission to comment or to do something on the document. There's our, our second user who in name is Partners EMEA, that's an email address I had in, uh, in place, so he also going to have read access, nothing more. We're going to add the permission, and at this moment in time, those users who are on the system going to get the document later on, going to be able to view it, going to be able to read it, but not going to be able to do anything, uh, anything different. I can close this up. I've seen the permissions. I've done everything now. They've been configured. And actually now I can hit the button start reviewing this document. And at this moment in time, I'm doing a connected review. I did not send out the document yet, which actually is something uh, I want to do uh, right now. But first of all, let me save it so that I have a, have a copy here. I'm going to browse. And there we go. I'll give it a version, version 1, and let me just save it on the OneDrive. Why do I doing this? Because I'm going to send out an email later on. If that doesn't work, I can always go back and, and search, uh, search for the document. So, I'm going to send the uh, document. This is my email address, but it's actually the user on, uh, on the iPhone. And I'm going to send him the document and say, like, Camille, I know you're on the road now. Please review this document. ASAP. Thanks, Wim. Voila. So I'm going to send it out. Obviously, don't forget to attach uh, the document so that he receives it. Okay, interesting. Okay. So you see it, it crashed now, but that's no problem. I'm gonna go back. So I'm using my personal uh, email address here, create a new one, go to here we are. I'm going to insert the file again. And then go to uh, to the OneDrive. And I see the document is not there. So, one second. It apparently didn't save it in uh, in the first time, so that was the problem. Save as browse. Okay, so it's on the one drive. Yes, replace, permissions are there, review is done. Okay, so now it should be there and let me, before I send out the email, let me just switch to uh, my Mac machine and um, you know just see if i can get the document here so i'm going to open it i'm going to go to my onedrive and if all goes well 
I don't see the document here. Not sure where it is. Thought I saved it, but yeah, I think there might be a little bit of an issue with uh, with the network here. Uh, that's strange. Save as. Yeah, it's there in the OneDrive, but it's apparently not uh, not syncing. Okay. It's a Microsoft yeah, that's a Microsoft <laughs> problem, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> that's very strange. Okay. So let's hope it sings in a, in a second then. Um, make my screen a little bit bigger here. Okay, so I've started the review now actually. Um, and let me do whilst it's hopefully syncing, let me do a, uh, a review here, for instance, with the typewriter and say like, you know, let's review this document. Here we go. And then I want to add a little note here, for instance, uh, select it and say like uh, marketing team are we okay with this statement? There we go. So you see the notes are, uh, are popping up uh, here already. So let me effectively save it again. There we go. One more time, see if the OneDrive is hopefully willing to What did you say? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I see it's not, uh, it's not synchronized yet. Yeah? Yeah, it's not syncing for one bizarre uh, reason. So maybe we leave this and eventually try and save it on the desktop. See if that works out. So this is my desktop. Save it. Okay, so if we now have the Mac version here, and then add this and kind of drop it. Hopefully that works out. Just taking care that I have the right version here. Sort it. Here we go. So if I do the magic between Windows and just, there we go. So it's a little bit of improvisation here for which uh, I apologize. Right, but actually what I wanted to show you here is, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it says that it's uh, the light bulb here says that the document, uh, the connected PDF document is protected by DRM because I added the permissions and Wim has started a connected review. Now you see the commenting bar here in Foxy Tweeter is not available. So um, I'm going to look at the permissions and what I'm going to see for myself now is that um, effectively I'm only allowed to read this particular document, which is not okay because I've been asked to do a review. So I'm going to ask if I uh, for more permissions and I'm going to ask to be able to edit uh, the document. So if the moment I click on ask for more permissions, I can choose whatever permissions I want to do. So I'm just going to do some edits 
and I'm going to send out the request. So at this moment in time, you know, uh, I know those things normally don't happen because if you ask somebody to review, you would give them edit and commenting uh, capabilities also. But I just wanted to show you that from a DRM perspective, um, you, can, uh, you can do it. So I'm going to close this window and now you see here on the right side, you see that somebody has asked uh, permission. I'm going to allow it. I can eventually change it, so I'm hit the allow button. Okay. So if I now go back to reader, um, it might take a couple of seconds, but the commenting toolbar should become, um, should become available. If not, I'll close the document, I'll open it again, and actually I can start uh, doing the, uh, uh, the comments and, you know, add comments to the document uh, as, I, uh, as I like. So if I go back to, uh, to Phantom now, You see my comments are here, and if I go to uh, Foxy Reader, I also can see this uh, particular comment. You, meanwhile, it took like 10 seconds, I think. You might have noticed that the commenting toolbar has become available, right? So I can now start uh, working on this document and, for instance, do a reply and say like, uh, we're okay, nice mission statement. So imagine just, you know, for, you know, to make things clear, this document is not somewhere in the server. This is a document that is loca local on your desktop, okay? The guy who's traveling on the road has the document on his uh, mobile device and will work from the document that resides on his device. As Carl mentioned, the beacon inside will connect to the server and will synchronize uh, everything. So you don't need you know, to have the document in the cloud and work on one single document. Everyone will his, have his versions, and you can have version controls, and everyone will always work on the latest and greatest document. So I made an additional uh, comment. I'm going to go back to, uh, to my uh, Phantom product, and in a while, normally the comment will appear, and the reply will also appear here, uh, as, um, as we can see. How are we on time, by the way? Um, five minutes. Still five minutes to go. Okay. So let me see if, uh, if I can, meanwhile, go back to. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just uh, go back one more time and see if. Uh, if the comment has uh, synchronized. So actually, Foxy Reader for Mac, uh, why I wanted to show you this is because you can, you know, it's independent of the platform. Um, obviously, if you're on the connected system, which Foxy Reader is on Mac and mobile PDF also, um, you're going to be able to use those tools, those applications, but it's an open system. So basically, uh, we're a little bit limited in time. When I would show it on my, um, on my iPhone and you would open it in native viewer on the iPhone, it would say it's not possible because Apple is not a partner uh, yet. So you need an application on your iPhone to see that, uh, to see that protected uh, document. Okay, so with a little bit of hiccups, this ends my, uh, my presentation. But should there be questions afterwards, I'll be around and I'll be happy to do it uh, a little bit longer and extended version. Thanks, man. Thank Sorry, I know we only had five minutes and putting this on probably took two or three. Um, all right, so we saw the demo there. Uh, as Wim said, uh, there was a few hiccups. Um, obviously, what we're talking about is something that runs, you know, it's connected, right? So obviously, if there's just you and your laptop out by yourself, no connection to the internet, there's no point connecting anything. I'm just quickly running through these items because I've got something special to throw you 
to you, show to you at the end. 23% um, risk reduction once you know the, this <coughs> excuse me type of solution is in place. A 30% cost reduction and 36% increase in revenue, down and up again. So the, this here, um, this slide here shows you the, the uh, conclusion or every item, every positive item of uh, what we've been talking about today. So first of all, what I'd stated was that we had a document deluge everywhere, 12 versions that we were putting together. Now with the solution that we're putting on the table, one of the, the keen ideas that we had when putting in place was to solve that. Profitability, um, I mentioned that before. Um, okay, so when it comes to Foxit, whilst there may be many other people out there who've got their, um, who have really well-functioning companies, in order for this to be successful, you need to have a large number of people um, already reading and viewing what it is that you've got to put on the table. Otherwise, you've got to keep going and grabbing another viewer and another, um, another plug-in for that viewer, if you like. And ideally, actually, no, there's one thing I didn't tell you about viewing. So we will have online a way of viewing a connected PDF. So if you're not using Foxit, that's cool. You click on the link, it goes up, and you can see that according or integrate in according to um, whatever particular um, functions you've put in place when you're building it. Um, easy, to, easy to make use of and no cost to implement. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, I'm not sure how, I don't think you thought it was that funny, but there's no cost at all uh, in making use of what we've got here with connected PDF. Lastly, um, as we like to say, uh, it offers you unprecedented control of your business documents compared to you just uh, you know, running along with a whole swagger there for you not knowing which one is the latest one or which one you want to roll back to. This is the bit, not my name, that's... Not the cool bit. So, just bear with me. Now, I just want to check we've got no coverage here. So, I mentioned we... Doing it, especially knowing what the product actually does. So thanks for your time here. Uh, any questions, please come up and ask anyone here on the front line. It's always, always a, a, a risk to have a, a live demo.
All right. That's. I'm sorry. Sappy, that's right, yes. And he will present us um, a solution for comparing the documents in the video. Fantastic. Great. Just checking the volume is working. I can hear it echoing back. Um, so, good afternoon. My name is Dean Sappy. Yet another Aussie up here talking to you. We are taking over the world um, a little bit at a time. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about what we do in terms of comparing PDFs um, and I guess sort of the science involved and the various uh, tricks and ways in which we're able to do it and um, some of the, the, um, the problems that you can get when comparing PDFs. So just a little bit about who we are. Um, DocScorp, you may not have heard before, we've been in the PDF space for nearly 14 years, but we tend to work very much in the legal market, the accounting market uh, worldwide. We do a lot of work with uh, PDF creation, comparing, uh, removing metadata, um, and also a lot in the Microsoft Office space. So we're a reasonable size organisation, we are spread around the world, development in Sydney, but we have teams in London across the US um, using and developing our products. Um, a range of products, PDF Docs is a PDF editor, Compare Docs, which is what I'm going to be talking a bit about today around comparing documents, Clean Docs for removing metadata, which is really important in some, particularly some of the regulated industries, certainly legal is a big area, and Content Crawler for making PDF searchable. So that's the advertising, that's who we are. Um, while I'm talking today, if you've got any questions, um, I'll encourage you to ask them. Firstly, that way I know you're awake. And um, secondly, I'm sure if you don't understand something, probably the person next to you doesn't understand it either. If you ask a good question, you'll get a koala for it. So that's the, uh, the reward that's in store for questions. Um, I'll preface this by saying, although I many years ago was a developer, I'm not the developer of this product. I'm, I run the company, um, but I don't developed, haven't developed for 13 or 14 years. So I'm not going to be able to tell you every single scientific part of what we do, um, but certainly I know a reasonable amount uh, about how we work. I'm going to talk firstly about what's the science involved in how we compare documents, maybe how we do it differently to what you might have seen before, and particularly in comparing legal documents, contracts and so on, how that method is really important. Um, and some methodologies that are there for you to use those sort of technologies that are available. And we do work a lot with other software companies where they license our components to just compare PDFs. Um, so there's various methods of comparing PDFs, and I'll touch on those. Various ways of showing the differences between documents, um, which will make it easier for somebody to, to read them. Um, broadly, what we do when we're looking at changes in documents is that we are looking for changes in text. We're not looking to see, did the text move from the top of the page to the bottom of the page? We're looking to see, did it, the text move or change in relation to other text? So if I've got two versions of a document and literally the only change between one document and another is the document was repaginated, so pages started at new places, maybe there were some extra spaces between the paragraphs. From our perspective, and from a lawyer's perspective, if they're looking at what's changed in the document, that's not a change. So we're looking for textual changes, uh, looking for complete paragraphs. We're not looking line by line, because again, if you reformatted the document and the paragraph has now got narrower but longer, that's not a change in the text, it's just that it's reformatted different. Now, I know there are other applications that more focus on comparing the images in a PDF, what pixels have changed in a document. We'll certainly say this picture has changed, but we don't delve into this particular vector or this particular pixel has changed. We're looking at the textual changes which affect the meaning of the document. And broadly, the way we do it is looking for essentially areas of sameness. We're looking for strings of text that are the same. And then the bits that are left are the bits that have changed. And that's what we then will look at 
marking up in various different ways and showing how that text has changed. And there's various techniques to show those changes which are going to make it easier for the reader to actually see what's happened. So we are looking at these documents and often in these documents there are extensive changes between one and another which means the document has completely reflowed um, not just because of page sizes, because of, because of tables that have been added, because of paragraphs that have been added. So we're looking at those areas of text and they're marking it up. But importantly, not a line by line comparison. So we're not just looking at one line with a carriage return at the end. We're looking at whole tables. We're looking at whole paragraphs. Um, and that gives you a much more concise markup of the text. You really only want to see the text that really did change, not um, just that it moved from, from one place to another on the, on the document. So what do I mean by that as an example? What we're almost trying to do when we're comparing PDFs is to do what you would do in Microsoft Word when you look at track changes. When you're using Microsoft Word and you're using track changes, you can see what's changed in the document and everything has been reformatted and marked up. That's essentially what we're doing with PDF and with Word documents. And we try to get as close to the two as possible. Now, there, of course, there's limitations with what you can do with PDFs. We can never get a PDF back into its original Microsoft Word format to know everything, every single thing about that document. But we aim to be as close as possible because a lot of our clients are actually comparing PDFs to Word documents. They're not comparing the PDF to another PDF. So that's essentially what we're trying to do is to mark up documents like that. So it's for legal documents. So what are we trying to do? We're com trying to compare a PDF to a Word document. We still find in our world um, for wholesale mass changes of documents, they're not marking it up or changing the editing the PDF. They're going back to the source document and changing that. So they might want to compare the, a PDF with the original and Word or an image PDF with a text PDF, or PDFs created by different applications. Um, so as I'm sure all of you know, depending on what software application created the PDF and how it created it, the flow of text is going to be different, how it's positioned, the fonts might look the same, but internally they're going to be different. We've got to deal with all those issues when we're comparing them. Um, we're certainly having to take into account, do we look at the text in sequence? Um, as it's positioned on the page, or do we look at the actual components in the PDF? So we provide different ways of working on that. And then we allow that to be done using various different techniques. So we have, as part of our CompareDocs product, an SDK, which is licensed by lots of other software companies, SAP license it, a whole bunch of different, um, either um, traditional software vendors license it, or corporates will license it for their own internal systems. Um, it works on a desktop, we've just released it, so it works as, a, as an add-in in Microsoft Word, literally in the add-in store, it's there for free. You go to the, the add-in store in Word and you can select it and start comparing documents. Um, a Windows 10 app we've just released, or it can actually run as a web service and you can call it. So there's lots of different ways people are using it. Um, what other ways are there to compare PDFs particularly? As far as we know, and you guys might have developed your own um, applications internally, but really the only other way is the way Adobe Pro does it. Um, I guess we follow a similar line, but we've taken it a few steps further, particularly in terms of working with Word documents. Um, and of course, Word and so on has their own um, you know, built-in features. But again, you can't use those from a development point of view and run them on a server. So when we're comparing... PDFs, there's sometimes an advantage in comparing them as a PDF. There's, I guess there's sort of two broad techniques involved in how we might go about comparing documents. For some people, actually the best result is we convert them across to Word and then compare them as Word documents. But that's not always appropriate, particularly if the PDF is a more complex layout. It's a series of forms, or a series of columns, or a series of boxes. Uh, an example is the, uh, the, uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. We use this for comparing labels on, on um, items and looking at different versions of those labels. They're PDFs. Now, they don't want them reformatted while they're comparing them. They want them compared without any change into the actual format. 
In those cases, it's really a one-page PDF compared to a one-page PDF. It's not a legal contract where they've added 10 pages in the middle of the document. So it's a different sort of circumstance. So in that case, we want to look at the PDF. And I'll show you some examples then of how we go about that and how we mark it up. Um, but for those sort of documents, those complex documents, comparing them as a PDF is going to give you a better result. Um, certainly where you don't want the output to change. Um, now that means it's not going to reflow the text, but that's fine, that's exactly what you want. Um, what we also do with that is we find people say, look, we want to compare forms or documents or PDFs that were originally a PDF form and we only want to look at certain fonts that have changed. So an example of that is we have a large accounting firm in, in New York. They produce tax returns from their tax software. They come out as a PDF. The main body of the, of the form is the same every single time. So there's no need to compare that. The actual data that comes from the client is showing in a different font. So we're actually able to compare it by just saying, I want to look for just Arial or just Helvetica or whatever the font is, and just compare and mark up that text. So you can get with a PDF, as long as you can isolate the font, um, you can drill down on and actually showing just those changes. Um, the other way of doing it, which I'll show you as well today, is actually using the, the word methodology, I guess, to compare and to show the changes in a document. So actually have it put all the changes in line in the document. Um, and that's where we come to how we present the changes. Um, we can mark them up and show them in line. Let me show you an example. So I guess the first way of showing the changes in a PDF, and this is, I guess, more the Adobe Pro way of, of comparing documents, entirely appropriate for some documents, um, particularly where you don't want the formatting changed. So we will look for areas of sameness in the documents. We will try to um, make sense of where you've added extra paragraphs and move the whole document down. So we deal with that sort of issue. But then we'll mark up the changes by putting comments, highlighting the changes, and I'll show you this running live in a minute. We'll underscore, okay, this text has been inserted. Um, maybe put a red strike through if, it, if the text has been deleted. Now, for some people, that's a good way of marking up a PDF. But if you go and talk to a lawyer and say, OK, I've marked up your PDF, this is how it's changed, they'll say, well, that's not much good to me. I need to be able to print this out and then take it with me to court. Now, of course, the comments, it's too hard to print them in there. It's too hard to read them. Um, now, another way is we could do it side by side. So that's another way that we will show those changes. We'll show the before and after and it'll literally show the two points of view. This is the document now and this is what is different. This is the original document and this is what's different. Here's the two pages side by side. That makes sense for some people. But for other people, they say, actually, I want it marked up like this. So I actually want to see the changes in line. Now that, of course, presents complexity in PDFs because we've got this whole PDF format that has a fixed layout and everything is in the same page. As soon as you start trying to add extra text in, so in this case I'm saying I've inserted this text but I deleted this text, um, of course your documents needs to reflow to fit all that information. So it's got to move onto other pages. PDF's not a great, great format for that. Um, so that's where we tie in actually converting to Word, and then we have an engine which actually looks at the Microsoft Word document and marks it up and changes it and then outputs it. Um, so we find actually in a lot of cases when we talk to organisations wanting to compare PDFs, they're really wanting this sort of output. And so we have to talk them through, okay, for that to happen, really we're going to have to go through a process of converting the PDFs to Word. Now that's fine, we can do that but it's a different set of issues that it brings up um, because your document is going to change format ever so slightly. Um, it's no, it's, yes, we could make the final output of PDF, but essentially we're going to Word and then back to PDF. Um, but for a lot of people, that's a more usable format, a, a more 
um, I guess, friendly way of, of reading what's changed in the document. So we have lots of people then talk to us about that and say, well, okay, we want to compare the documents, but there's other ways of, of doing it now. So we could just ourselves convert the document to Word and Microsoft Word has a compare feature. They do. It's not particularly great, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and in fact, where Microsoft is heading with that is when you look at Microsoft Word Online or Word on an iPad, there is no compare feature at all there anymore. Um, so that's why we've added an add-in into, into Word. Um, so, and I guess using Word to compare documents, it's not really designed to be put on a server and programmatically called. It's not built as an SDK. Um, now, of course, Adobe has this feature in Adobe Pro, um, but as far as I know, that's not available as, as an SDK or a, or a feature. Lendable correct? It's not available? As a, no, no, it's in the app. You're, you're 100 correct. But it's not in the SDK. Correct. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, if you wanted to programmatically start comparing PDFs, you can't do that in Adobe Pro. Um, you know, why isn't Microsoft going to improve it? Or what's the issue with using Word? Um, and I talk about this because we get lots of organizations come to talk to us. They'll email us and say, great, we'd like to try your SDK. Well, no, I'll try and do it in Word because Word's free. I'll just kind of make it work. There's certain things that Word won't do or won't mark up very well. Um, and here's an example. And this is why we built two comparison engines. We built an engine for comparing PDFs and marking them up. And we've also built an engine for comparing Word documents and marking them up. Um, why have we done that? Because even in Microsoft Word, it doesn't do a particularly great job of, of marking up the changes. So if I had two documents, they might have originally been PDFs or they might have been Word, and I had a table of contents, when I compare that in Word, it says the entire table of contents changed. And we'd say, well, actually, there's just a, a few um, paragraph numbers have changed and some page numbers have changed. So for our customers looking at using and being able to see how documents are compared, that's really important. They don't want pages and pages and pages showing as being changed when really it's only a few small changes. So things like tables of contents, things like tables is a real issue. I'll talk in a minute a bit about some of the complexities about comparing what looks like a table in a PDF, because there are still some limitations with that. Um, but when you're just comparing Word documents and comparing tables, you'll find issues. So, you know, for example, it will show basically every cell being changed in a table, and we'll say, well, really, it's actually a column was deleted and a column was inserted. It's a simpler way of presenting it. It's, there's not a right or a wrong. I guess you could say, well, yes, I really did change every cell. But more than likely, what you did was you inserted the column and then deleted the column. So we've done a lot of work in refining that, and that's why most of the big law firms around the world will use our technology for doing this, for Word or for PDF. Um, similarly, marking up paragraph numbers and so on. So when I'm comparing PDFs, we have a number of techniques um, for doing that. So one of the ways is that we will mark up with comments and then we will provide the little comments down the side in the comments pane so you can see those changes. And particularly if it's a form or some sort of document like that, that's going to make a lot more sense. Um, the only thing that it doesn't do is handle moves. So Microsoft Word does this if you make some changes in a document. It can track a move. It can track a, a paragraph went from page one to page five, but other text stayed where it was. Um, so some people need that to happen. We do that when we're converting to Word. So let me give you some examples of, of how we do it, and that might make a bit more sense. So if we're comparing PDFs, Let's do um, marked up with annotations. So I'm going to compare two PDFs as PDFs. So we've marked it up. And this is probably, I guess, similar to the way Adobe Pro would do it in terms of putting comments against each 
each item. So we're looking for what's all the text that stayed the same and then the bits that are left as the differences and then we're working out what's different between each and then marking them up and putting them as comments but also highlighting them on the document. So that's one way of, of presenting it. But we've dealt with, uh, we've figured out where the paragraphs are. So if the paragraph was just reformatted, we haven't shown that as a change. So if you just look at a, you know, some of these basic line-by-line -line comparison products, they're going to show vast amounts of the document as being changed, where we're showing a, you know, a small amount of it. So we can do it like that. Or we could say, well, actually, we want it to be um, side by side. And in that case, we're then saying, OK, this is the page after. This is the page before. And again, with comments, showing what's changed. Some people like that. It, it depends on the particular workflow. Out of curiosity, has anyone tried to build their own PDF comparison application or tool? No. There are people who have tried. They don't often admit to it, or they start and then realize it's actually much harder than what they originally thought it was going to be. Um, um, as far as we know, other than Adobe, we're the only ones that compare PDFs like this. Um, let's do it another way. Let's do it as a track change document. So we find for legal documents, actually, this is a, sometimes a better way of doing it. So what are we doing here? We're converting the PDFs to Word. Um, now, there's no great science in that. We use Solid to do that conversion tool. No point us developing that when somebody's already got it. Um, we convert the documents to Word, and then we compare them as Word documents using our Word engine. And there it is. In, now, in this case, I've said not only do it as Word, but then re-output it back to PDF. I could have just left it in Word. So I've marked it up like this, but that way it sort of reflowed the document. If there was entire paragraphs, they would all reflow and move down. And some people find that is easier to read, certainly if they're then going to email it to their client and the client's just going to look at it on their, on their iPad or something. This is often an easier way of of seeing those changes, the little comments and things, but it's a different way of doing it. Um, so I've got a few different, I guess, techniques. Now, what are some of the, I guess, the, the problems or the issues that you might have? There's a few, I guess, limitations with comparing PDFs. What we are doing is comparing I'm going to find a folder of documents so I can actually show you an example. I'll just go into, into Compare Docs and show you. I'm going to choose a couple of other documents. Where's my PDF conference folder? Here it is. And I'm going to choose this document here, Table 1 and Table 2. So these are two PDFs that were tables. Let me just show you what they were originally, just so you get a concept of what I'm talking about. Don't mind my messy desktop. I've been told that a messy desktop is a sign of a sane mind. So, so I've got two PDFs. And this is where these are the things we don't handle very well. So I want to be open about. There's stuff that you can do when comparing PDFs, but there's only so far you can go. I've got PDF number one that looks like this. It's, it is a table. I know it's a table because I created it as a table. But the PDF doesn't know that. Let's have a look at the second document just so you can see what the difference... The different, where is it? Table number two. So all I've done is I've moved a few words around. I've deleted some, I've moved some, and, I've, and I've, that's the changes that I've made. Now I want to now compare those documents. So let's try that. Because this is where you start getting into the limitations. So let me go back to Compare Docs. There we go. 
So I'm firstly going to compare these documents um, marked up just as PDFs. I'm not going to convert to Word. I'm going to leave them as PDFs. So it said, okay, there was a change here. There were some changes here. Remember when I talked about how we compare documents, we look at where text has changed, but we're not looking at the position changes. In this case, the PDF is not intelligent enough to know that it's actually gone from one column to another because it doesn't know that it's a column. So that's where we start getting the limitations of comparing PDFs. If you're looking at changes in tables, um, that's sometimes where the PDF can just get it wrong. It just doesn't know, well, I guess by definition, it's not thinking about has the text positionally changed. If it's changed in a column, that could really change the meaning of the text, but the way we're doing it, we're just looking for changes in text and it doesn't do it. However, doing it as a Word document, you actually, funnily enough, get a better result because what we're doing there is we're firstly saying convert the PDFs to Word and we're using some of that intelligence that was built into the Word comparison engine and what it, sorry, into the Word conversion engine, I should say, and it guesses what the table should look like and puts it into a Word table. Once it's in a Word table, we then actually know about columns and cells and everything, and we can then actually mark it up better. So with documents that are tables, sometimes we actually get a better result, again, using the Word engine, but we're relying on a good conversion from PDF to Word. Bear in mind, our ability to do that is only as good as the ability to convert from PDF to Word. Um, so there's still going to be limitations where we just get it wrong. We just don't know exactly how that docu document originated in Word. And in our world of documents, most documents that our customers are working with started life as a Word document or maybe a spreadsheet um, and then have become a PDF for that purpose of, of sharing around the world. Um, so there's always limits about what we can do. So it's not a perfect science. And I don't think it will ever be a perfect science unless somebody knows some magical way. If, if Leonard doesn't know a perfect way, then there probably isn't. But, <laughs> um, but there are limits to what you can do. It's never going to be 100% perfect comparing PDFs. Comparing Word documents, much, much more accurate. Um, yeah. I was thinking it's actually, it, this, this is actually interesting because I'm think, I, I know how our compare engine works and, and, and seeing the differences. Yep. We don't ever do the conversion to Word and, and, and such. That's right. Um, but when you talk about the things like the tables and such, we actually do the table comparison in, in natively in PDF. Yep. Because we're understanding, we actually understand the structure yep. of it. We know, we say, okay, yeah, that's a table. Like, Yep. PDF. Right. So our comparison will say, oh yeah, there's an inserted column here and delete it exactly what you described. Uh, okay. But doing it natively in PDF. So you guess where the columns are. You might not you not yeah. might not know it, but you just guess. Okay, that looks like a column, we'll make it a column. Right, well, in, in the same way. In yep. the same way that when solid is exported yep. to Word, yep. it's guessing, yeah, that's probably a table, let's make it a table in Word. Yep. We're just doing that natively in solid. Yep. Yep. But, yep. but you're absolutely right about the concepts in terms of yeah, if you want, the user wants to know that that's a table, a column was inserted. Um, lists are also very interesting, as I'm sure you know, in the same mm. way. That's and right. Yeah, you know, a list item was inserted, an item was moved, you know, was, 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 was indented in the list versus, oh no, this is something totally different. That's right. It's understanding that semantic model of yep. the content that really is what you're dealing with in the comparison. That, that's right, that's right. And, yeah, and there's, there's that two fundamental ways of comparing PDFs. It's looking at them, the text positionally. Okay, the text has moved from here to here. That's really important for me. Um, but in the vast majority of the documents we're looking at, it's not the position of the text, it's, it's the text itself and how it relates to other text, and that's what we look at. Um, yeah, what you talk about with tables is we're starting to go down that rabbit hole now in terms of us interpreting it in the PDFs, also interpreting headers and footers, because headers and footers is another whole world of pain, which I haven't touched on yet. It's great if in the PDF specification, when the PDF was created, they were properly 
formatted and, and marked as headers and footers. But in our world, the vast majority of the PDFs, it hasn't been done that way. It's that the header and the footer is just text on the page. We have no way of knowing categorically it's a header or a footer. We can guess that, okay, well, that's the same on every page. It probably is a header and a footer. But we don't know for sure. I think as the PDF conversion world improves and as lots of these third-party tools do it better, we'll get more and more PDFs that, that tell us, yes, it's a header, yes, it's a footer. Okay, we can deal with that in the PDF comparison. And when we're comparing PDFs, if they are marked up as headers or footers, we deal with that. But the vast majority of PDFs we see don't, don't give us that, that information. Um, and so often we'll show the header and footer changing every time. Um, so that's how we compare PDFs. Do you want a koala for that? <laughs> well, I'm, but I don't want to take them home. They're fly, special flying koalas. <laughs> they are now. Sure. That's right, raster images. So we don't mark up vector changes. So if somebody had an AutoCAD document that's become a PDF, we're not dealing with that. We're not looking at vector changes or raster changes. We're just saying the image has changed from here to here, and we just show, OK, the image used to look like this. It now looks like this. We don't mark up which pixels. We don't do vector graphics. It's just in our space that you know, the, we're broadly, I guess, what I'd say, the document management world. Law firms, accounting, banking, finance, accounting, um, pharmaceutical. We don't see much in the way of vector graphics. A bit in government, we do, but yeah, not I'm as much. Thinking in terms of things like charts and graphs coming out of Excel, either natively or based in the word. Yeah, yeah. Um, stuff, not, not things your customers are seeing. Or no, I look, at, very occasionally. Um, I don't know of a technology that does it, to be honest. If, if you, we do, and I was curious. If, right. If Yes. So if you want to see like between two versions of a chart, yep. did somebody change the colors of the of which pie is which? Things yep. like yep. that. Yep. So we identify changes like that. Right, so right. I'm curious if you, if your yeah, we don't go to that level. Um, we we give them the choice of of whether they are actually even interested in font changes um, or or um, size changes. Because often the document's been reformatted, it's now in a different font or size, but that, even that's not interesting to them, or whether it's bold or italic, so we can ignore that. Um, uh, so that we give people the choice. The other choice that we give them is, do you want to compare documents at a character level or a word level? Um, because if you've marked up a document and you just change one letter in a word, some customers will say, well, we really want to see the whole word has changed. Um, because that's going to stand out more to me. And others, particularly in some other languages, so if you're comparing Chinese documents, it's a whole different concept. You want to just see individual characters because individual characters are words. Um, but in some industry, yeah, they just want to see the letter was changed from A to B rather than this meant the whole word changed. The, the other area that we do a lot of work on is making the, the changes readable. So if you've changed every second word in a paragraph, you've probably really changed everything about the paragraph. It's just a coincidence that the ands and the these and things are still all there. Um, so we get to a point of saying, if more than, say, 50% of a paragraph has changed, let's now show the whole paragraph has changed. Um, and the same, we do that with PDFs as and also with Word documents, just to make it more readable. To be honest, I've never looked at what Adobe does in, the, in that way, whether it just does character or word. Um, but that's, just, that's where we see a difference in how we go about doing it. So you get to the sort of a tipping point in a paragraph where you say, there's just so much change in that paragraph, let's just show the whole paragraph has been inserted and the other one was deleted, rather than just this word here and here and here and here and here. 
was, was deleted and inserted. It just makes it more readable. Yeah. Yep. So if, if, if the page number's changed, then we'll track that and we'll mark that as a, as a change. So, you know, for example... Oh, sorry, reference page numbers within the text. So you're referencing this as yep. chapter XYZ yep. on page number 10. So that would show as a change. In a similar way to what we're doing here. We're saying, well, there was no change here, but these page numbers, the, the reference pages changed. So we're certainly looking for that sort of thing. So if you just literally all you did was reformatted a document and that meant page numbers changed, um, it might also mean sometimes list, uh, paragraph numbers and list numbers change. Um, there's no actual text change, but you've just maybe split a paragraph into two paragraphs. So now your paragraph numbers change. We certainly will show that. Um, but certainly page numbers, um, footnotes, endnotes, all those sorts of things, we're looking at those because they really do change the meaning of a document. You want a koala? No? <laughs> Everyone's, no one's going to admit they really want a koala. You've shown that there's also an SDK, API on SDK version of this product. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of how the SDK works, we can either, I, I think is what you're asking, can you output the raw data or the, just the document? Uh, with the raw data, then I can just have another tool and say, okay, this has been changed. They are completely identical, but that's the only difference that I found. Yeah, so the SDK will either say, here's the document marked up, or it will say, here's the raw data. Here, uh, you know, this particular paragraph on page number five was changed from this to this, and the API will just give you that raw data. And then how you want to present that to your user is up to you. So we have some people who then say, okay, that tells me which page has had a change in it. Now I'll just go and, I'll just go and pick those pages and show those to my, to my user. Um, so that's the advantage of the SDK. It gives you both choices, either the raw data and you format it and do with what you want. Um, maybe just to know, well, how many changes were there in a document? rather than actually showing them the final document. So you can do it either way using the API. Is it a special file format or is it just uh, technically on an API that you can query uh, a list of uh, changes? Yeah, it's just a, a, an API. You call the API, pass it the PDFs, and, and depending on what call you give it, you either get the raw data back or you tell it to produce the final document. And you can choose, do I want the final document to be a PDF? Do I want it to be a Word document? Um, you know, even if it's an image PDF, we can tie in the OCRing into that, so we'll OCR the, the document automatically so that we can then compare the text, and then we compare the text and then give you the output that you want. Um, so it works with any, any PDF. There's no proprietary formats as such, but you've just got to license the API from us, and we license it various different ways, either as a, for an organization or for a server, or you know, in some cases it's a per comparison Pricing model just depends on what works for whoever we're um, licensing it to. So, um, any other questions? All right, thank you.
Uh, I'll give the uh, I'll give the chairperson a couple minutes to. Uh, yeah. Do you know who's chairing this track? I assume Barrett. Sorry? Barrett, Barrett. Where? I don't know where it is. Yeah. But I would say, you know what? You're a big boy. Uh, what time you got there? I got 34. Alright. We're fixing 34 if I were in yours. Yeah. Well, before we get started, everybody, I've got a, I've got a confession to make. <laughs> this is not my only slide, Duff, but this is about as fancy as they get. I've um, decided to, to give up keeping a keeping my phone in my pocket for this presentation because I just know that, um, you know, the office is just coming awake back in the U.S. and, you know, if I leave it in my pocket, I'm going to be checking it just about every two minutes and looking and, and seeing is there, is there something I'm missing, is there, you know, someone that I need to pay attention to, is there a situation that seems to be brewing. And I got to say we all... Look, we need to have a talk, okay? Because there is a situation brewing here. I remember a time, and I think some of you do also, PDFs used to, they used to be reliable. You used to be able to send a PDF to somebody, and you'd have some confidence that when they opened it up on their Mac, or on their Windows PC, they would see the same document that you sent out. It used to work. It used to be cool. Well, how do you think our users perceive PDF today? Are we hearing that it's reliable, it's bulletproof, everything works the way it should? Are we hearing that when we look at PDFs on phones, our iPads, when we look at them on our watches, when we have our screen readers read them to us, are we hearing that we're really, our users are getting the experiences they expect? They look the same everywhere. Is that what we're hearing? How come there are dozens of tools out there that exist just to convert PDF into HTML for the sole purpose of removing the need for a PDF viewer. I'm not even talking about reflowing, reformatting, changing the appearance at all. In fact, these converters pride themselves on keeping the same appearance, keeping a fixed layout. Their only reason they seem to exist is to remove the need for our tools. Does this make you happy? Let's talk about how we got here. And let's talk about the future of PDF. 
let's look into what we can do to help change this situation. Let's talk about what PDF promised, what actually is today. I'm gonna to introduce a philosophy called PDF Core, and I'm gonna talk about PDF support in the future. Well, let's start with what PDF promised. Now, Leonard's presentation this morning quoted John Warnock, and I think it was a very good quote, but I wanna talk about what came after the initial release of PDF and what the key promises were during the 1990s. Now, in the 1990s, the world was tired of proprietary formats. The world couldn't open files reliably. Maybe you had WordPerfect 5.1. Maybe you had a version of Microsoft Word. Did that help you open things up in Omnipro? Probably not. The world was tired. They needed reliability. They needed interoperability. And documents you could send to people and have them reliably viewable, reliably printable, reliably exchangeable. PDF promised these things. I want to examine each in turn. Now, inter interoperability is an interesting topic. A PDF has always been a toolbox. It has never been a guarantee of reliable interchange. There are many reasons one may encounter a PDF that one can't necessarily view or work with on their system. This is important. It's not a limitation of PDF. This is in many ways a feature of PDF. PDF is many different tools, has always allowed for, has always encouraged a variety of different workflows. PDF has tried to serve and serves very well many purposes over time. It's been a great paper and page description language replacement. It's made for great active documents. It's made for a great data containing format, holds semantics. Many ways, the notion of documents and what they can be have been expanded by PDF features over the years. And portable documents have always been possible. They've always been key to the promise, the PDF value proposition but it's never been a guarantee. And reliable interchange? Well, PDF standards, they set the rules of the game. But just as the English language, the dictionary and grammar and syntax set the rules for how I might deliver this presentation, there's still a lot of latitude for creativity and interpretation. I could very well try to deliver this presentation in Shakespearean English. I might not get very far. You probably wouldn't understand me, but syntactically that would be perfectly valid. And as the syntax of PDF has grown tremendously over the years, as the feature set has grown, we see the ecosystem has never quite been able to keep up. Now, we have a complete set of PDF features. This has never truly and completely been supported by all consumers. This is not necessarily a bad thing. This is just the way things are. As we keep growing, we keep gaining features, we have a tendency to see features as benefits just for the sake of existing. And more features, they are benefits. They are great for those who need them. But for those who don't need them, they just get in the way. More consumers come along, more features come along. We have different PDF consumers, different workflows, different audiences over time. Used to be Acrobat, you could get for your Windows desktop, 
you could get for your Mac desktop. Of course, you could get it for your Solaris desktop too, but thankfully nobody cares about that anymore. But this was pretty much it. You sat at a computer that had a keyboard, had a screen, remember they used to be made of glass. You worried that staring in front, you know, sitting in front of it all day would irradiate you to death and you know, give you head cancer. That's not the world that documents exist in anymore. We have those readers still, but we also have screen readers, readers that don't have necessarily displays at all. We have automated data capture, no real notion of a display, simply a process that looks to suck the data out of documents, PDFs, and otherwise. We have watches, we have radios, we have other devices that can read our documents to us. And it keeps growing, and it's going to keep growing the ecosystem will continue to grow. And every consumer that's part of that ecosystem, they will make their own trade-offs. None will ever be feature complete with respect to PDF support. So if they're not gonna be feature complete, well, what's wrong with just adding more features? Why don't we just let those who want to support features come along? Why don't we encourage everybody to support everything? Well, I'm here to tell you that's not gonna happen. It's happened in PDF producers much faster than it has PDF consumers. And so what this has led to over time is the unexpected and the unrequested use of a number of features that users don't understand are not necessarily reliable. Most of the time, users don't even want these features. They don't even know they're requesting these features. Most users of InDesign who put a drop shadow on, on a graphic because they think it looks cool, don't necessarily realize that they're taking a, a PDF and turning it into something that has transparency start to shift color now, depending on how it's printed. Programs that emit CMYK by default, we start to see documents that aren't going to necessarily be color accurate on mobile devices. Layers, portfolios, ways, you know, things that contain content that is important, but that a number of viewers don't understand users complain about missing content. And this is not even to start on 3D annotations or forms or XFA or flash or any feature that's perfectly supported by PDF, the specification, but not necessarily supported by PDF the ecosystem, and yet our users find their creation tools support these features without warning our users they may be in peril. We have more programs, ever-growing ecosystem with more processors. Life was much easier back in the day, right? We used to be able to assume there was a human somewhere we used to be able to assume there was a computer somewhere instead of a phone, instead of a watch. We used to be able to assume business documents were simple. We used to live in a time where bank statements didn't use transparency in their, in their corporate logos. Nowadays, we see these things. There's a set of assumptions that come with the notion of a document, of a page-based document, of something that we expect our users to see and to create a certain way. These assumptions, we can't assume they hold any longer. So that's the situation today. 
We have a number of different screens. As Leonard likes to say, from watch to wall, and that's just counting the screens that are actual screens. This doesn't include consumers that have no visible screen at all. We have a great and thriving ecosystem of toolkits. Each of us, each of, each of our tools, and each of the tools from vendors that are not here, we have varying levels of support for various functions, various capabilities. And not only has PDF taken over the world with the consumers that we know of today, PDF is also taking over a world of consumers we aren't really, we haven't imagined in the past and is gonna take on consumers whose forms we can't conceive of today. They will be there in the future, PDF will be there in the future, but PDF as it stands today will continue perhaps to be a problematic experience for some of these future consumers. This plethora, this, this PDF ecosystem, has it led to more reliability? I don't think so, and I don't see any hands going up. It's diluted, in many ways, the value proposition of PDF as a format. Less reliable processing, it diminishes the value behind the openness of PDF. PDF as an open standard is great, PDF as an open standard that isn't always implemented well does not bring as much user value as it could. So the brand of PDF, it promised interchange, it promises reliability, it promises compatibility. But let's face it, more often than it should, to our users, PDF, it delivers complexity. So what have we done as a community? We've made more standards. Because one didn't solve the problem, more will, will solve the problem. And each of these standards has been very useful in specific situations, specific workflows. PDFX has revolutionized what it means for a reliable interchange in the graphic arts. PDFA is miles ahead of any format for archiving that existed before its inception or that exists even now. PDF UA is a milestone in ensuring universal accessibility to content for those who are heart or vision impaired or otherwise have physical limitations that limit their ability to interpret a visual medium. All of these, they're useful, they're necessary for very specific workflows, very specific parts of the world. But none of these will ever cover a majority of the PDF user base. So how do workflows, how do they really work for most of the user base? Well, we experiment, we see what's widely supported. We discover that a popular word, or popular, uh, uh, sorry, presentation, uh, uh, creation software tool exports very nice PDFA files, except it drops content if you have transparency without telling you. We gather our folklore, we learn about things like that, we learn, okay, we have to stay away from that. It becomes part of the story of document interchange. It becomes part of the set of things to avoid through which we form a lowest common denominator. And we learn about these things by people like me getting up in front of you and 
telling you and other people that these things don't work. I don't know about you. I don't think this is the best way. Maybe there's something better. And maybe as creators and as the people who create creators, maybe it's time for us to do a little better. Instead of focusing on what we can do and how much we can achieve, all the things we can include in a document. Why don't we acknowledge the PDF, it's a large standard. It's a huge amount of different capabilities. It's very complicated. Let's not look, let's not aim to bring complexity. Let's bring portability back into our thinking. Let's get back to making documents that are useful for a broader audience. Let's revisit what was the PDF core promise. So I want to introduce a philosophy, that PDF core, that promise. This philosophy, I like to think of as doing things as simply as possible, but no more simply. Doing the simplest thing that can work, but not being any simpler. We can, we have a few examples here. We can take color spaces that are widely supported, and when our content can be expressed in those, let's use those. No more CMYK black. No more spot colors for each and every pigment that we could express in RGB without losing any information. Let's embed our fonts. Let's acknowledge different viewers. They have different fonts they include. They have different versions of different fonts. Let's make our content streams both syntactically as well as expression-wise as simple as possible. Let's use the simplest expression for our users' content that works. Let's express the look of that content using means that complement and echo that meaning. Let's stop scattering letters all over the pages of our content streams. Let's acknowledge it's much faster, much more reliable to search for words when we present words. Let's use fonts that have correct information. Let's not make bold face by putting down the same piece of text 4,000 times. Let's use a bold font instead. How about that? If we have a piece of line art that visually looks like one piece of art, let's group it together. Let's not scatter all those paths all over the place. Let's write our content streams in the order that somebody whether seeing or a screen reader or otherwise, in the order they, they should interpret it. Let's make content extraction as simple as possible for the broadest set of processors out there. Of course, I'm not saying let's go back to the stone age of PDF. PDF has a lot of great features that complement content, that embellish content, that make content much more useful. Let's use those. Let's understand, however, that our processors, they may honor this content, 
they may skip this content. And you as a creator don't necessarily know whether the processor that your user on the other end has, if it will honor your tag PDF or discard it, if it will look at your metadata or ignore it, if it can interpret your layers or just show a default. Use these things, use these features to make files more useful, to make them compatible with screen readers, to bring semantic information into PDFs, to include optional content. Just the name optional content gives us a hint. This content is optional. Let's use these expressions. Let's understand they may not get to our end users. Let's not use content expressions that would make a file useless or damaged or misinterpreted if they're not processed. Is this backpedaling? Am I saying that we're wrong for wanting to have advanced workflows in PDF? Am I beating a hasty retreat? Am I encouraging everybody to give up on helping all our users out? I don't think so. PDF, it still has that promise of allowing complex workflows, very technically rich expressions of information. And for many workflows, these make sense. When you know your audience, when you know the tools your audience will be using, supports these features, go ahead, use these. This is what helps your audience. But when we're looking to make PDFs that have the broadest possible support, let's keep that complexity in our back pocket. Let's save that complexity for when it really is truly useful to our users, when we know it's useful. Doing this, expressing as simply as possible, simply it ensures that broadest possible support. It acknowledges that a lot of the workflows, a lot of the use cases that we as a community have striven to support over the past years, they have limited audiences. General purpose documents should be tailored to be as general purpose as possible. Let's remember PDF, it's a tool chest. It's a large collection of tools, but we need to use the right tools for our purposes and our audience. So I said maybe it's not optimal to share folklore about what works. I said maybe there's a better way. But I'm still going to share some folklore about what works, even though there's probably a better way. Broad support. Some examples are, are up here. This is not a, a definitive list, but certainly a starting point. Many could agree have broad support in as many tools, as many scenarios as we may be aware of. Things that are very useful to include today, metadata, layers, tag PDF, annotations, these are all very useful. As long as we include them as compatibly, as usefully as possible, and again, as long as we understand these may be used, these may be picked up, these might not be. 
make content, make PDFs that don't lose their meaning just because a viewer, a processor does not interpret some or all of these things. So what's the future gonna look like? That's today. I've painted a, a rosy and cheerful picture of today, I know. And in many ways, the future may look the same. May look the same, pardon the pun, I'm sorry. But there is an acknowledgement that we as a community are coming to and that is we've stopped assuming that every single word, clause, subclause, sub, 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 probably sub, sub, clause, will be supported exactly and completely by everything out there. As a community, we've made that assumption in the past. That's gotten us to the situation we're in today. PDF 2.0 looks like it will continue that acknowledgement with that philosophy that things that are supported should be supported well, but an understanding that not every processor will support everything. Not every scenario for PDF usage has an interpretation of every PDF feature that even makes sense. That's okay. That's better than the situation that we're in where we're not certain about anything and what anything supports. But I've gotta say, between all of us, it's time to establish what is supported. It's time to move past folklore and to figure out what is broadly compatible. Is this backtracking? Is our future one where we're stuck with just a checklist, a small set of features that we can use? No, of course not. The future is acknowledging that documents are useful to audiences, but not all documents are useful to all audiences when we know that we're targeting a broad audience. The PDF core, that philosophy that outlines we want to use, we want to ensure the broadest possible support, let's acknowledge this as a very important use case. Let's use it as a default strategy for when we create our documents. Let's ensure the value proposition of PDF, reliable interchange. Look, processors, as more and more come on, there's only gonna be greater and greater variance in the features they support, in their presentation of documents, in their user communities, just in their workflows, in their forms, period. We don't know what the future of consumers holds. But we do know that PDF's promise of portability relies on usefulness to a broad audience. In brief, the value of documents is measured by how useful they are to their audience. An audience that can't use a document that we create derives no value from this document. Most of our audiences, most of the time, 
they're not using specialized tools. They're not in specialized workflows. Some of them are sitting in front of a computer. Some of them are sitting in front of a phone. Some of them, they're gonna be having their phone read their PDF to them as they drive to work in the morning. For the broadest possible user value proposition, use the simplest PDF expression that matches the audience's needs and focus on the portable part of portable documents. Thanks, everyone. I'll be happy to take questions and comments from the audience. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Thank you. That's, that's a great question, Leonard, and uh, well, don't let Duff hear since he just stepped out of the room. <laughs> that I, I really believe that there are two parts to the situation that we find ourselves in. I've outlined one viewpoint, one part, which is that we as creators need to acknowledge and live in the world as it exists today. There's another part, and that is that we also as users, but also as creators, and we as producers, I'm sorry, we as producers, but also we as consumers, we need to continue as an industry to challenge ourselves and to challenge everybody who participates in the ecosystem to support as much of PDF as possible. So if we both acknowledge the world as it exists and we strive for a better future, a more compatible future, where more features are better supported by more of the ecosystem and the tools out there. I think these, both these philosophies, they complement each other, and I think both of these are necessary. And I think industry organizations such as the PDF Association, these serve a great purpose in helping to foster support and enthusiasm for broad support, for compatibility, for reliability with respect to the PDF standard. I think also the audience of users that's not in this room, that doesn't care about the mechanics of PDF, 
that doesn't necessarily want to learn how to forge an axle in order to have a car to drive to work. We need to find ways to rally them so that they demand better PDF support instead of looking at alternatives. As you pointed out this morning, there's a great community out there that doesn't want PDF to go away. They acknowledge and they rely upon those aspects that are reliable, but they want more. They want a better experience. Part of having a better experience is having a more reliable experience. And whether that means one sees the same thing across similar type viewers, or whether that means that one gets a useful representation across as many different viewers and processors as possible. Well, PDF started out as, and still is in many ways, a page formatting language. It presupposes a very physical description of the world. And that's not an arena that many of our users expect anymore. So how do we, as a community of consumers, give as reliable an experience in terms of presenting content as usefully as possible, reliably, across as many different platforms, environments, scenarios, periods of time as possible. I think these, these work together.
Yeah, we have to wait. Yeah. What? No. Oh, he's going to do this, not me. Am I, am I going to do this? I th yeah, I think, because I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Ten euros. I have ten euros for the buddy bear. Do I do I hear twelve? Do I hear twelve? Twelve. Do I hear fifteen? Fifteen euros for the buddy bear. No, I better stop that. It's not mine to raffle. I should quit while I'm ahead or behind. I think Tomas will remind us all when uh, he's back at. There will be a PDF Association member meeting immediately fo following my brief remarks. Maybe I'll let Tomas tell you all about it. Yeah, but it's, it's your closing session, Duff, so and, and we start now, please. So the first version was an 800-pound eight, uh, gorilla slide monster. That slide's gone. <laughs> so I hope it's uh, 5 p.m. Uh, and we need a little bit time for the drawing. Okay, so, and so am I correct, Tomas, after my uh, remarks, there will be a drawing and also a member meeting, is that right? Yes, the member meeting is at five. Okay, so all PDF Association members must stick around, don't run out the door. We need to have a very important member meeting. So I'm here to give you a, a few brief thoughts about investing in PDF technology over the next five years. Uh, these are entirely my own thoughts, um, and I'll just start right in cover a few items here. Where is PDF today? What is just around the corner? Where I think PDF's going and, and perhaps what we should consider investing in. First of all, and I think you've seen one or another variation of the globe slide in several uh, presentations over the last couple days, and I'll go ahead and just repeat it one more time. PDF is everywhere. We won. Success. We can all go home and, and rest easy. No, it's not quite that easy. But we have done a tremendous amount in the 23 years since PDF was invented. So I started tracking the uh, usage of electronic documents online in uh, 2011. It's relatively easy to do. You can do file type searches, and as long as you track this information in a spreadsheet, well, then you can go ahead and crunch a few numbers and come up with these proportions. As you can tell, uh, when compared with, uh, with uh, uh, document files, Microsoft's Doc, DocX files, Excel, and PowerPoint files, PDF amounts to approximately 80% of the proportion of electronic documents online. Uh, that number goes up, it goes down, and there are all kinds of variations in how Google seems to compute the actual numbers. But uh, obviously a tremendous number, uh, the vast majority, in fact, of the, of the electronic documents placed on the web are PDF files, and they continue to be. Uh, other things are continuing to, to be strong for PDF as well. Uh, in in uh, last October, uh, at the PDF confer technical conference in San Jose, we, we, uh, we, we, Phil Idens told us, and I've con certainly confirmed this and seen it myself over time, that, that he found 1.6 billion PDF files online when he did a file type search before that event. I did a file type search a few days ago, found 2.1 billion PDF files online. I don't think the, uh, Leonard found 2.2 uh, 2 billion, I think it was, in your search a, a few days ago as well. Th that number seems to change. Google's approach to doing this is, is very variable, but if you measure it over time, you seem to get a, a pretty clear sense that there's more PDF files and there's more every day. So there's another kind of source of information about PDF that I particularly like to, to uh, pay attention to, and that is the Google Trends information. Now, Google Trends is complicated in terms of what it really means, but I found from actually a, a resource that I found of a Google developer talking about this who came up with a, a very simple way to think about it. Uh, Google Trends is pretty lousy for estimating search volume. Uh, it's not really the way you'd approach that subject at all. However, it's an excellent way because it's, a, it's, a, it's placed in terms of proportion of searches against all other searches conducted on the web. It's a good way to understand my awareness and mind share of a given subject. 
When we look at PDF, when we simply do a, a, a Google trend search for PDF, that is to say, that term as compared to the search volumes, uh, for, for the entire search volume, we see this trend. There is almost no other technology I could identify that has a trend similar to this. Um, iPhones, yes, that trend is going up faster, okay? That's because it, 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 that product came along and it's still a very exciting consumer product. But it's extraordinary how, f how few technologies, and I've, I've searched for them, have, uh, have show this kind of track record in terms of the, 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 not only the interest in the technology, but the uh, continuing expansion of the awareness of PDF technology out there. And it's, uh, you, you go further with Google Trends. You can do a lot of very interesting things with this tool. Converting to PDF is, of course, you know, dramatically uh, higher uh, in interest than converting from PDF. But again, both of these things go up. The awareness of PDF continues to go up. Why? I'm going to tell you a few things that you already know, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I like to talk about this. PDF is a unique set of subtle but extremely powerful capabilities. They're, they're, they're capabilities, they're not just features. They go to the very essence of what PDF is as a technology and to the very fundamental essence of what users find of value in PDF. It's inherently a cross-platform technology. It doesn't care if it's on Android or anything else. Uh, it, it, the documents may be shared with total fidelity. You may unify content from different sources, from a CAD system, from a word processor, from an Excel file, from a scanned document into a single format. And PDF in includes a rich set of features that not only mimic paper, providing a bridge between the, uh, the paper-based world of 20 and 30 years ago into the electronic world of today. So PDF has a number of inherent capabilities, but beyond that, there are several other features of it that, made that, that, that together ensure that it is this world-class world platform for electronic document applications that we have today. Number, and number one, the tradition of free viewing software for PDF. A critical feature, a, 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 a great innovation when Adobe made this change in, in 1993 and started to produce, the, and, and instead of charging for a PDF reader, made it free software. This, as a result of the, the, the free viewing software and of the published specification, a large ecosystem of developers grew up catering to many diverse needs. Many of you here in this room know exactly what I'm talking about because I'm talking about you. Uh, this published specification, the combination of a published specification and a free reader led to an explosion of different kinds of uh, solutions for different kinds of document needs and all revolving around PDF technology. The ISO standardization of PDF in 2008 has only increased this trend. Why does ISO standardization matter? It's something that we, we often take for granted, but we rarely examine why. Let's just quickly iterate through this. First and foremost, with respect to PDF, ISO standardization reinforces a fundamental aspect of PDF's value proposition. It's open, it's interoperable. I can make a file, give it to you, and if, I, and if you can't read the PDF file that I made, we both have a problem. Uh, standardization addresses customer concerns, particularly larger enterprise type customers, re concerns regarding vendor capture. This is an increasing, uh, increasing concern in governments and over time they've decided that the extent to which the technologies that they base their, their solutions on are ISO standardized, this is the extent to which they, are, they can be independent of their vendors, which is where in principle they want to be. So the democratic control of the specification that comes along with the ISO process reduces risk for developers. It facilitates development based upon a broader industry needs and, and attending to specific customers. It allows us to go down particular roads for, to, to specialize in this area, confident in the knowledge that the developments in those particular areas will nonetheless uh, be available and, 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 and useful to the general purpose uh, applications to which PDF is put all over the world. Subset standards can emerge from ISO standardization to address these archival, Print, uh, printing, accessibility, reuse, and other kinds of needs. And uh, so ISO standardization, of course, has been, as I mentioned, been taken up by government, which has decided quite sensibly that, that it, it prefers ISO standardized technologies and it, and it enforces that kind of preference in terms of the way it procures technologies and the way it regulates that certain kinds of uh, processes take place, whether that's in the aerospace industry, the nuclear industry, and in many other sectors. Government's insistence on a technology that is in principle independent of vendors is a key part of, uh, is a key part of what they're looking for and, and PDF meets that very well. So governments have indeed increasingly specified PDF. 
Um, uh, model requirements from the European Commission mention PDFA. The Standards and Markets Authority here is looking to establish an electronic sing a single electronic format for, for uh, reporting financial information. There's the Zugfeld standard in Germany that, uh, that adopts PDFA3 and turns it into a way to automate business pro uh, critical business processes, including I I related to invoicing and billing. The National Archives and Records Administration in the United States in 2014 updated their guidance and uh, now strongly recommend PDFA and PDF, uh, uh, PDFA and PDF both. I don't mention it here, but the US Library of Congress calls the combination of PDFA and PDFUA they're, they're the, essentially the ultimate fixed file, uh, fixed layout format that they'd like to see delivered. Uh, US Section 508, this is an accessibility specification for federal agencies and contractors in the United States. Uh, that draft specification, it's been grinding along for many, for many years now, but that draft specification includes specific reference to PDFUA. The US courts have been recommending PDFA for a long time and are in the process of, of making this recommendation. Uh, permanent and and uh, um, requiring it for all the files that they uh, that they receive, and on, in Australia the Public Record Office of Victoria is also now requiring PDFA. What's just around the corner for PDF in the terms of these standards? ISO 32000 Part Two feature complete uh, under final development and will be published in early to mid 2017. Something I think we can all be very happy about that. PDFA4, we call it PDFA Next right now. It's, it will be effectively the, 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 the next part, the fourth part of PDFA, is, uh, will be PDFA4, PDF 2.0. It's simpler. It has no conformance levels. I think all of us are, will be able to, will appreciate this when we're going out and talking to our customers about why it's important to consider uh, opportunities that, that PDFA4 uh, and PDF 2.0 can deliver for them. PDF UA2 likewise will be based on PDF 2.0. And I should mention that PDF UA2, uh, P in PDF 2.0, the, uh, the subject of tagged PDF in general has been completely revised and rewritten by uh, a process initiated by no, no other than Olaf here, who has done a tremendous amount of work uh, to uh, make sure to take that relatively fuzzy set of specifications that we have in 1.7 and turn it into something that's really genuinely very powerful uh, uh, set of uh, or, uh, or organization of, of standards, of requirements that allow for the true interoperability of, of uh, semantic information in PDF content. PDF E2 uh, will provide an archival model for engineering content, and that, that is to include 3D, which is now natively supported in PDF 2.0. ECMAScript uh, will inc uh, is, is becoming uh, standardized for PDF with two parts that will be coming out more or less at the same time. Number one, core PDF support, and then extensions for 3D annotations. There's a lot of interest in that area uh, um, from the engineering community. And there'll be the XFDF specification is also, uh, is also under development at this time now at this stage. And PDF raster is a, is a specification that, that has been uh, requested by the Twain organization and now and, and, uh, developed under, in a collaboration with the PDF association uh, we're looking to finalize that specification over the next month or so and hopefully begin to, to, to initiate the process to publish that and possibly even turn it into an ISO standard later on. So the marketplace, it's an interesting marketplace. It's an enormous marketplace. Where is it in 2016? It's grown up over time. We had the world of publishing. We had the world of business process management, records management, and enterprise content management. These things have existed under different names. You know, they didn't call it BPM back in the 1980s, but they still had the process where here would come an invoice and here would go a payment and so on and so forth. PDF, became, uh, PDF intruded into this world by providing the kind of solutions that would enable all kinds of processes and all kinds of activities across the spectrum with this amazing new technology allowing people to share content. First, there was creation and editing. Collaboration came along shortly, and pre-press and print technologies required new workflow software that brought together the editing and creation systems with pre-press applications. Capturing from image became critical very early on. It's one of the reasons that we see, as Leonard mentioned earlier, 25% of the PDF files that Adobe software see, saw in April were scanned images. All kinds of other technologies began to sprout up in the 1990s, all associated with PDF forms more workflow software to help forms interact with PDF documents, 
workflow services to bring these things together with BPM solutions, with records management and enterprise content management systems, scripting to, tie it, to give these things more intelligence. Uh, at some point, the accessibility, uh, requ accessibility requirements emerged and, and became part of the PDF specification back in with uh, PDF 1.4 and 1.5. More recently, we saw the addition of, of geospatial and 3D technologies to the world of PDF. Oh, I skipped too fast. PDF is, is, is grown in all kinds of directions. It's this huge, giant octopus with all kinds of features. Is it, do, does everybody support all these things all the time? No, they don't. Are all these things, do all these different kind of features and capabilities create problems in our, in our world? Yes, they do. And nonetheless, these things emerge in an in a, in a organic sense because the people want them at some level or another. And it's our job as the industry to find a way to not only br maintain and bring uh, these features to people, but to do so in a way that, uh, that still meets the fundamental core value proposition of PDF technology. So what are key marketplace demands today as I see them? And it may be very different from the way you see them. To begin with, I think workflow solutions are something that, that, are peop that we find in the surveys that I've, uh, that I've been uh, collaborated with, with certain mem uh, uh, so members of the PDF Association. It's very clear that workflow solutions involving the approval of documents, sign off, and the ability to, to, to move a document through workflow in, a, in an automated fashion is a key thing that people are looking for in their, in, in their electronic document technologies which is closely associated in broad sense with the automation of business processes. And this is where technologies and concepts such as Zoukfer can be such a tremendous assistance. And more than that, uh, bridging ECM and records management systems is also a, a key demand. I, 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 this anecdote comes to me more and more frequently all the time. I go to the AIM conferences, and the, most recently in New, Orle in, uh, New Orleans in the, in the US. And, I, and as I go, maybe a third of the sessions there, have to do with how do we bridge ECM systems? How do we get from that accounting system that we bought five years ago and that records management system that we upgraded last year, how do we make these various systems talk to each other? These are, these are the things that people want, and I bet you can suspect how I might imagine that PDF can help solve these problems. More on that in a second. We want a better user experience on diverse, on diverse devices, and this is something that we're gonna be hearing more about, I think, o over time. Uh, we want machine processable structure to facilitate reuse. One of those uh, phrases, again, that, that Len Leonard mentioned is this idea that PDF is this place where data goes to die. Um, for many of the people who are saying this, it was also, uh, while they were saying this, it was also true that for the previous 10 years, it was possible to add structure to a PDF file so that the content was perfectly reasonably structured, that we knew what the headings and the tables and the lists were in that content. Was this information generally, uh, 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 were, were these people generally aware of this capability in PDF? Or if they are aware, of, they may have been, well, they may not have been. But the fact is that up until now, this, technology, this kind of capability has been only in a very limited subset of PDF files, not particularly heavily supported, uh, either, either in creation or editing. And yet, this is something that I think the marketplace is incre increasingly looking for from this technology. Um, fundamentally also, they don't want any more friction. Okay, they want their bad software to go, they don't, they don't know what friction looks like in terms of the software itself, but they want, but consumerization is the new watchword for successful software implementations out there. And consumerization demands quality and it demands uh, very fu fundamental and very low level interoperability between these various systems. So these are the demands. So, but do people like thinking about this stuff? They do not. PDF in the world today, it's, it's so commonplace, it's so generic, it's, so, it's in every possible place you could, uh, you could look for in every industry, in every sector, in every uh, country on the planet. PDF is like breathing. You gotta do it, but who wants to really think about it? In fact, as soon as you start thinking about it, it becomes kind of stressful, right? Am I breathing? Am I breathing enough? Too much? Too fast? Too little? PDF is kind of like that. We don't want to think about, nobody, none of those end users want to think about it. They have us to think about it for them. Will we do a good job? So keep it simple, okay? Keep it simple, stupid. Feature the solution, not the PDF. If you talk to them about the PDF, their eyes glaze over. If you talk to them about how you're gonna solve their problem, the, uh, the, the story gets much more interesting for those users. So how can we leverage PDF as a platform for building those sorts of solutions? I'll refer to the, 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 the previous set of uh, marketplace demands in the following way. We can build on PDF forms and digital signatures and uh, annotations and so on to facilitate workflows 
for, for those users who have, or are looking to develop more and better ways to interact, to, to, to allow different units of their businesses to talk to each other. We could deploy end-to-end -end digital signatures to provide complete chain of custody so that PDF files never go off the reservation. They're always, uh, they're always an asset, and we always understand who touched it, who made it, maybe made a change to it, has that metadata always been present, and so on. We can use attachments to share not only human-readable uh, information, but also simultaneously machine-readable information. And this is the kind of functionality that Zoekfeld offers. It's also the kind of thing, if you imagine, that an attachment could be anything, could be any blob of XML, could be JSON data. It could be something that, it, that is deployed uh, automatically to update entire manufacturing workflow processes. And there, there are more and more people, I think, look, realizing this and getting excited about doing that. ECM systems, uh, over at the AIM conference, we, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we were listening, uh, I was listening to vendors, uh, or to customers, I should say, complaining that their vendors don't, you know, the, uh, IBM over here and Open Text over there, not to pick on them, but just they're two big ECM vendors, you know, they make their, they, they have their individual systems and those systems will not talk to each other. And the vendor, the, the, this is what the customers want, but the vendors are not interested in delivering it because it's, a, they, as far as they see it, it's a way out of their solution and into somebody else's solution. This is ripe for disruption, people. PDF can solve this problem for these people. Take a PDF file, c collect all the metadata that's associated with it in, in ECM system A, take all the comments that were applied in that system and, uh, and we have a model for that in PDF. You can drop that metadata into that PDF file, collect those annotations together, ship that document over to ECM system B, unwrap all that information, install it into their system, and you've bridged it for them using a PDF file. That's an opportunity. You could use tagged PDF to drive new sorts of user experiences, right? Once you have a fully tagged PDF file, that fully tagged PDF can readily become an HTML file. You could, that's an interesting way to deploy it to a mobile phone or onto a watch or onto a wall or to do other kinds of fascinating things with PDF files. Uh, you can, and this is at the same time, once a tagged PDF or retaining the semantic structures from its source file, it's something that, it's a, a, that no longer is a roach motel for data. It's something where the data can be readily identified, extracted, reused, repurposed, and so on. So not only can you, so you can solve several, several kinds of, uh, several problems here with the subject of tag PDF. Um, you can solve the problem of data being lost in the PDF. You can solve the problem of, interesting, of, of how to deliver on different devices. And you can solve the problem of meeting accessibility obligations as mandated by government. That's quite a few important birds to be killing with a single stone. You can, we can leverage, I have to put in a plug for Vera PDF, OK? I've had a little bit to do with this project. Uh, in general, the consumers, they need, the higher, they need higher quality software so that the solutions can become simpler, so the, kind, the, the modern users become more and more comfortable adopting these things. We can leverage and we can most importantly extend Vera, Vera PDF to encourage users to demand higher and higher quality software from their vendors, to encourage them to change over their software so that they perhaps get less interested in continuing to use that very, very old creation software that they bought for almost nothing and deployed on all their desktops uh, because it seemed like a good idea. When they call for support, those people aren't there. We can give them all kinds of reasons to using uh, validation tools and perhaps even a certification mechanism. We can encourage them to think of new ways, uh, new ways that they want to use PDF and get them enthusiastic about seeing PDF as something a little bit more than just a page image. So where should we invest over the next five years as an industry? Just some ideas, okay? PDF is, to my way of thinking, a platform for solutions development, not so much a solution in itself. Uh, the, more we, the, the, the more we understand PDF at a deep level and create up and think about opportunities to uh, solve in, uh, the, the larger problems of the world with PDF, we, we find ourselves some interesting opportunities. To my way of thinking, one of those major sorts of opportunities is in this ECM space, where I've heard, where I heard this year, and I heard last year, and I've heard every year for all the years I've been going to AIM shows. This is maybe 15 or something out of the 20 years I've been in this industry. People have this problem, which is information exists in silos, and they have no idea to bring it, how to bring it together. It strikes me that because the vast majority of information that they're referring to happens to be documents, that this industry and these people in this room have some solutions for that problem. PDF 2.0. It's cleaner, it's clearer, it's much more fully documented than it ever was before. 
Uh, I should know I've spent a lot, a lot of time with my fingers inside this document, but frankly, it's not my opinion of it that matters, it's yours. And what I've heard from, from developers who've been looking at PDF 2.0 is that it's a dramatically better document than PDF 1.7, and they're looking forward to developing towards it. Um, so I'm going to say PDF 2.0, a fantastic place to, 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 to stop in, to think about what it is that you're going to be doing next. And why should you think about that? Well, it's got new features. It's got, it, it creates, it, there are new subset standards that will be applicable to it. When you do new things, you can say, we've well, got something new. The marketing people like that. What else do the marketing people like? 2.0 is better than one point something, right? All the marketing people in this room, they understand what I'm talking about with this. Tagged PDF. Well, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for tagged PDF. I, I'm perhaps a little biased. I've been involved with developing and promoting tagged PDF since uh, the very early days where it became possible in PDF. I've said, I've said several things about the kinds of interesting things you can do with tagged PDF. I would encourage you strongly to consider that investing in this area, doing creative, interesting things with it is something well worth exploring. Attachments. Um, there are all manner of wonderful things that we can do with attachments. This is uh, for everything, the original idea perhaps is that you could include the source file along with the PDF file when you delivered a PDF document, but it goes way beyond that. It goes to the question of business automation. It goes to the question of delivering both machine readable and uh, human readable data at the same time. It goes to the, uh, uh, the idea of presenting a, a, uh, a, a conventional document and perhaps uh, uh, delivering supplementary information that goes along with that document in, uh, as well. It simply takes the idea of that, that, that fabulous idea of PDF as a unitary package, a complete document, and allows you to extend that idea and expand it to include all manner of other content that doesn't necessarily fit into the strictly PDF paradigm, but nonetheless will enable a wide variety of business processes downstream. Never forget when we're doing these things. In a constantly changing world, the users will need, they need today and they continue to need a technology they can trust. We must, it is our responsibility as a PDF industry to continue to deliver a technology that the users can trust. We can't do, th we, we should avoid private use as much as possible. We should do things that, uh, we, should, we should encourage developers, both ourselves and others, to do things that are in, in line with best practices, to, to, uh, to, um, to build on the kind of, the, the, the reputation and the, and the application that we, to which we put PDF to grow our industry very much in line with the value that users see in it, even when they're only thinking about a simple page. As long as we do that, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna have a problem. Because the need for a document of record, okay, that's independent of a, of a database, that doesn't just exist on a web server, that I can email to you, and that you can email to somebody else, those things are, I don't see them ever going away. Uh, and they may, but it, I, don't think we, I don't think it's within our, our, our time frame that we're particularly interested in right now. Consistency, interoperability, are the core of PDF's value. And I, I think that if we, as long as we as an industry make sure that everything we do attends to that, then we will be in very good shape for the future. Thank you very much, and I would be, love to hear from you. What do you think we should be investing in in the next five years? Any? Thank you. Okay, any yeah, proposals or Christmas wishes? <laughs> I called it in the morning. So, Leonard presented something in the morning. No, not really? Okay. It's the end of the day. It's That's the end day. of the day. Maybe it's a long one and we're really close. Um, yeah, so the last action of today for all attendees is the prize drawing of the exhibitor quiz. And then, as Duff mentioned, at 5 we want to start the member meeting, so all the members PDF of the PDF Association who want to join us, please stay in the room. <coughs> but first we want to do the yeah, last easy action, and we need a lady luck, and I found our, an international guest from Russia, so she will be lady luck. Small.
So what is the name? The winner is, or let's check, everything is right, looks good, and it's Lucia Todova. So Roman, you can take it on behalf of Thank Lucia, you. you also get the box. Stop, stop. So the box for a safe transport. Um, we need a second winner. Uh, maybe Dirk Lütgens or Lüt. And let's see who's the third winner here. Andrew Holmes. Andrew Holmes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Berlin buddies like to travel to the United States. So, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, he's not in the room, but I want to say again a special thank you to Matthias. So if you go out and maybe you want to thank him. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So a very big thank you for Matthias. So. And then our professor also says goodbye to all the attendees, please. <laughs> Oh, I was, I'm not prepared to, do, to say much here. So anyway, so I've been, uh, I've had the honor of serving as a chairman for the last uh, almost six years, not quite six years, but almost six years. Um, the major thing to say is time flies by. <coughs> I, I thought it was just four years, then I saw the slides and it's already been six years. <coughs> it was a pleasure to, to work with all of you. Um, I hope you... Um, enjoyed having me as a chairman <laughs> uh, and um, I'm really looking forward to the next chairman and we will, we will find out uh, later today actually or tomorrow? tomorrow tomorrow so just for your understanding right after this we will have the member meeting and the board will be elected and then the board will determine the chairman that's how it works in, in the PDF station so I'm really looking forward to that and um, I hope he will do a much better job than what I've been doing and will take uh, the PDF station even to yet another level, next level. Um, yeah. Thanks for being uh, the members I could serve. <laughs> and um, have a safe trip back home. And good luck with whatever you do. Thank you. Yeah. Also, for me, just a safe trip home. Thank you to all attendees. Have a safe trip and check out. I Strongly hope we will have another PDF days next year. But Okay, so as, as I said, the members, please stay in, in the room and we we'll just wait a few minutes.
Thank you. 